Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're very excited for our first annual West Coast Vascular and Interventional Symposium, Clinically Oriented Medical Student and Trainee Symposium. We hope this, this will be a very educational experience and show you some of what vascular and interventional radiology has to offer. We're very excited for our world-renowned speakers and panelists. If you have a chance, um, go ahead and please uh, use that QR code that's uh, on the screen right now. Uh, it's our pre-conference survey. We'll also be doing a post-conference survey. Um, so without any, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is none other than Dr. Joji Vatican-Cherry. Dr. Vatican-Cherry currently serves as the program director at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles, where he's just, where he started an incredibly vibrant clinical VIR practice. Dr. V, looks like you're sharing your screen, so I'll invite you to go ahead and start your presentation. All right, thanks so much for the kind uh, words, Sanavji. This is uh, very exciting. This is uh, something I've been thinking about and dreaming about to set something up like this. So kudos for you guys actually making it happen. Uh, great team effort. Okay, so let's define our role in the medical spectrum for this very new specialty. So what is vascular interventional surgery or vascular interventional radiology? Well, it's minimally invasive. It's really not surgical because we're not making big cuts. But it is oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes image guided and is certainly procedural based. So why are we doing this? Why is kind of, why did it come from the field of radiology? It's kind of an oxymoron in some sense, but it's because it started off with maybe 1953 when Sven Seldinger figured out a way to image the body without opening the belly. And so he could do the, use the highway of the blood vessels to evaluate the whole circulation. So in 1953, he published this the simple but revolutionary concept of getting a needle with a hollow end into a vessel, wiring it, pulling that needle off, putting a catheter over it, and imaging the whole body from head to toe. So again, the vasculature is a, is a highway to do intervention. But really, we weren't intervening at that point. What we were doing, we were just taking pictures. Okay, that's what radiologists did. And the Charles Daughter was an original angiographer. But he, again, a visionary and a revolutionary transformed medicine forever, very rapidly. In 1964, on January 16th, the world of medicine changed. And what happened was there was an 82 year old female, Laura Shaw, severe congestive heart failure. Her heart function was so poor, she couldn't tolerate you know, anything. But she had gangrene of her toes, and every surgeon said, You need amputation. She refused. She's like, I'd rather die than lose my leg. She had no surgical options. So, daughter, for the first time ever, uh, opened up her vessel percutaneously through a little groin incision and kept her limb uh, there for the next few years. So again, this seminal event in January 6, 1964 changed medicine forever. And you know, he he's a prophet of sorts in the medical community. He said, if the, in 1963, before that event in June in Czechoslovakian Radiologic Congress said, if the angiographic catheter can be more than a tool for passive means for diagnostic observation, used with imagination, which he had a lot of, he can become an important surgical instrument. And boy, he was in line. This tradition of innovation is tremendous in our specialties, starting off with daughter. But then his first fellow, Melvin Judkins, learned cornea angiography and a brachial approach and says, I could do it better. He developed these catheters, the Judkins, right Judkins, left and pigtail, that are still used to this day throughout the world for cornea angiography. Joseph Roche was, uh, came from Czechoslovakia to the US, to Oregon, and he worked with, under the tutelage of daughter, and he decided, hey, not only can I open up vessels, but I can shut them down. So he did a GI bleeder and liver cirrhosis, embolized the gastropolic artery, the autologous blood cut uh, in the 19, early 1970s. Again, transforming medicine. Grunzik listened to daughter at the RSNA Congress and was like mesmerized by this concept and he figured out a way to make a balloon at his home in a kitchen using kind of standard products and did his first coronary angioplasty in the 1970s. This guy, Cole Pinto, figured out, hey, opening up the belly, connecting the veins and uh, in a patient's high risk as ascites and bleeding all over the place with a high mortality, I could do it more elegantly by going through the neck and connecting the paddock vein to the portal vein and bypassing the liver percutaneously with a tip shunt Again, transform medicine. This gentleman, Julio Palmas, who uh, developed a balloon expandable stent that you can put in the, in the circulation. And this stent is used throughout the world. And probably someone has a family member has one of his stents, a coronary stent. 
to uh, for to prevent a heart attack or for treatment of heart attacks. Now, the beauty of the med of vascular interventional radiology, and this is why I love it. I enjoyed surgery. This is what I want to do, but I didn't want to be limited. And what's happening in surgery is getting so subspecialized that you, oh, you only do ENT. Oh, you only do ortho. Oh, you only do urology. Oh, you only do gynecology. Oh, you only do colorectal. Here, we're in the, the broad breadth of head-to-toe pathology doing minimally invasive, maximally effective therapy. Arguably, I would say we are the Renaissance physician. If you want to know all about medicine, everything you've learned and trained, this is the field. Now, the challenge is it's a lot to know, but let's talk about some of the basic tools. Basically, you're using needles and wires and balloons and glues and plugs and different things of that nature. And so the tiny, uh, tiny little needles to enter the vessels or enter the organ of interest, and then various wires of different tensile strengths, lengths, um, lubricity, uh, shape to enable us to get to where we want to get, and different catheter shapes to select the vessels in that highway to decide you're going to go in the 405 and exit on this ramp or that ramp to do what we need to do. We're basically essentially little snipers. And these tiny little microcatheters get to get to the tips of the toe, the edges of the brain, uh, to stop bleeding, to fix blockages. It's, a, it's pretty impelling what we could do, treat tumors. Uh, different sheets and snares to take out foreign bodies from the human body. And this is that tip shunt to, again, connect one, one vein to another or one artery to another or connect different structures or keep things open. So again, really awesome technology that we have, balloons, um, access kits, et cetera. So what do we do? Let's talk about kind of the vascular interventions that we do. Okay, this is a big part of my practice. So we do a lot of blood clot uh, management, DVT, clots in the legs, clots in the lungs that can be life-threatening. Okay, and that people die of, and it's a very high prevalence in the, in the population. We can remove that clot or we can put clot busting medication right into the clot and prevent morbidity and mortality. We put umbrella filters or IVC filters in the big veins to prevent clot from going to the heart and lungs and killing the patient. We can also remove these filters using various techniques, including advanced laser techniques, et cetera. Um, we, we can um, reconstruct the IVC. We can take care of varicose veins in a cosmetic or symptomatic fashion. We can fix aneurysms of the abdominal thoracic ureter or dissections. And we treat peripheral arterial disease, which you'll hear a bit more of, uh, from my former medical student and, or former colleague and uh, uh, intern, uh, Bolot Bad, our current colleague and former intern. Uh, let's talk about women's therapy, okay? So this is a big uh, spectrum of our disease and a very uh, rewarding aspect of my practice. So patients who come in with symptomatic fibroids, often in the underrepresented minorities, and we were able to relieve their symptoms without taking out the uterus, okay? And so with a small incision in the wrist or in the, in the artery near the hip, we can fix this. Again, the highway enables us to do this. Patients who can't get pregnant, we could open up their blockages in the fallopian tube and get them pregnant. If they're having an issue and they don't want to get pregnant, we can put an issue or something to block the fallopian tube. So there's all these things we can do. Or if they have pelvic pain, we can treat that as well. Brain work, a huge spectrum of disease that we're now managing, and it includes stroke therapy, uh, you know, which has really changed the landscape in 2015 because we have new devices to pull the cloud out. Before that, we really only had some IV medication, and they had a lot of bleeding and not a lot of benefit. Now we can take people who couldn't walk, talk, or speak and make them able to speak and walk and talk. And so you should be all aware of this for your family members, your grandparents, or, you, you know, et cetera, that, you know, balance, eye changes, facial droop, arm or leg weakness, speech difficulty, you got to move fast because people lose 2 million neurons a minute while you're waiting. We're able to fix this now. Andrews in the brain, which you had to crack open the skull to fix, we can now do it through the wrist or through the groin artery and fix it, and they're gone home in a couple of days, opening up blockages in the neck or the arteries in the brain, all these things. And there's a lot of emergencies in what we do. Coughing up blood, I did one this week. Bleeding, um, as I and I did this week. Um, you, know, tra you know, trauma cases that we could fix in uh, stabbing or gunshot wounds, anything else we can think of, blunt trauma. We also... Um, uh, you know, another challenging thing is postpartum hemorrhage. Patients have just given birth, and it's a, not an uncommon cause of infant mortality or, or, or maternal mortality worldwide. And we're able to stop the bleeding and keep them alive. And in fact, Dr. Macris is going to be talking tomorrow from the UK. He's been a big proponent of, of making the services available worldwide, and especially in developing nations or un, you know unrepresented nations. So, if you look at endovascular aneurysm pairs, something that I really am passionate about. Um, 1990s. 
94, 98, Michael Dake, um, who is a, a vascular and ventral radiologist, the chief at originally Stanford, uh, did percutaneous endografting of aneurysms and dissections and change the world of medicine. You used to be able to crack the chest, crack the side and do this big fix and put them on bump bypass. Now we can do a percutaneous and essentially awake. Tremendous change in the paradigm. Abdominal aortic aneurysm in the early 1990s, Juan Perotti uh, developed this technique with uh, Julio Palmas, who we talked about before, fixing the aneurysm from internal. We are now doing this in our lab on a Monday morning, we're sitting home Monday night, local, mild sedation, no anesthesia, small band-aids in the groin, that's what they go home with. It's unbelievable. The same day, the same day procedure, as opposed to an open repair, they're in the ICU, lost a lot of blood and never quite the same in months and months of recovery, this is days of recovery. This is an example of that, a patient who ruptured an iliac aneurysm and uh, accepted the transfer. Uh, and uh, because of the GFR issues, we gave gas, we blocked off one of the branches and we put in this metal stent graft. This is looking at you straight forward. This is the, your hip bone here, the liver here, the heart here. And this is the aneurysm, this bulge. It should be like this diameter and it's really big. So that bursts. So we can fix these again percutaneously. And this is again a before and kind of after view. And the way I do it is I kind of get access into the artery, put in a little uh, couple of pre-closed stitches. Used to, we had to cut down the artery, we don't even have to do that, just local, a little, a little poke. And then at the end, we close the artery and this is smaller than my thumb, this whole. This actually is from the Band-Aid or the Tagaderm that caused that little blistering. So the, the, the Band-Aid is worse than the actual surgery. That's what's crazy. We also innovate, this is a patient of mine who had a renal transplant and really wanted to protect it. And so patient was came to me for a second opinion. I'm like, look, I think open with visceral, with revascularization will be fine. You'll be okay with that open procedure. Unfortunately, I was wrong. And he coded, he was acidotic, he was in unit for weeks. And he's like, he came back to me like, I don't care. You got to figure something out. Whatever you do, MacGyver me. And that's certainly what we do in interventional. So I did carbon dioxide to protect his kidney transplant. I used an ultrasound inside his aorta to take a look at everything. And then ultimately I did what's called a sandwich technique, which was kind of being purported. Uh, the beauty of interventional, we have a very tight knit community. We all talk with one another. So I showcased this case to a bunch of different interventionalists around the country and kind of came up with the best idea. And uh, this is in fact, the sandwich technique has worked. He's about seven years out. And uh, this uh, vessels feed the celiac and SMA, which is feeds the whole basically mid gut and foregut up to the colon. So most of the intestines and the liver and spleen are fed by these. Those are all open and the aneurysm is controlled. This is the tip shunt. This is one of my patients who had refractory variceal bleeding. So they cough up a lot of blood because these thin walled veins burst and they're dying. And so we put in the sheath, we puncture the, uh, the, from the hepatic vein, which is a systemic vein to the portal vein. And the, again, the cirrhosis prevents the blood from going to the heart the right way. So it backs up to these congenital things that are so thin walled and they're under such high pressure that they burst and they can lose exsanguinate. We're able to fix this, put this metal stent in, again, essentially with a Band-Aid in the neck. It's unbelievable. This is a patient uh, that, of mine who had a significant bleeding. She was anemic, requiring blood transfusion, very vascular. This is a vasculature of the fibroids. And you can see this is an MRI of the pelvis looking from the side. This is the bladder here, the rectum here. This is the uterus with this big, lofty fibroid going into the canal and this bleeds in and that's what she has on a monthly basis. Severe cramping, horrible pain. And this is after six months. Her symptoms were resolved. She's great. Look at the bladder, it's extended quite a bit. She's urinating okay. So it's just a tremendous relief for these patients. This is an intracranial aneurysm. This is developed by Guglielmi at UCLA. Um, it's a detachable coil. And what that's done is revolutionize neurointerventional or in medicine again. So before you had to crack the skull up, open it up, identify the brain, damage collateral structures, important collateral structures, have a huge deficit. Now we can elegantly get there, okay? And this tiny thing here, this little aneurysm causes a lot of damage. We're able to put these little metal coils in there and basically exclude it from the circulation. This is, this, this is a CT scan. You can see these metal coils again brain, the eyes, and here's the metal coils. Pretty exciting stuff. New devices, um, like this is the penumbra, it's a suction device that we can use, or the solitaires, or trevo, or clot trap, or, or little embo trap, or little stent retrievals that we can pull out clot. Again, revolutionize the way we do it. This is a patient that I was able to be participating in the care of who had 
uh, it was a younger patient who had uh, what's called Lockett syndrome. He had a basal artery in the back of the brain. It's bad. They get locked in. They can't move. They can't talk. They can. They can. You know, they can like hear people. They can't do anything. They can't respond. So fate worse than death. And they have a very high mortality, like a ninety percent chance of dying. We were able to remove the clot. This is before. This is after. And you can see that there's all this flow here that wasn't there. And then subsequently, he's able to walk, talk, and move, and eat and live. Unbelievable. So here's the clot on the far right. But basically, this dark area here was clot, and now it's open. This is the brain. And this is an important part of the brain that controls so many things. This is one of my patients who had a blockage of the left kidney artery, was severely hypertensive on five blood pressure meds. I mean, if you have high blood pressure like that, your heart can, you can have heart attacks, your kidneys can fail, you can go on dialysis, you lose your eyes. There's so many negative side effects. So what I was able to do is cross this blockage and put a metal stent in, keep it open. Now, the beauty of our service, now, the importance of this, this meeting is not only do we compensate manage these patients from blood pressure standpoint, and, but we also follow them for life. So this patient, I continue to follow every year with a renal duplex to make sure the stent's open. And we often may have to do touch-up work. And I check our blood pressure to make sure that's not titrating up either. This is a, a, a truck driver who came in, he was driving, and then his leg just kind of went limp. Severe pain, he came in, and he actually had this aneurysm. This is a bulge. This is the normal side. This is a big aneurysm. You can see this is a normal artery here. And this aneurysm, the problem with this aneurysm is behind the knee, they shower clot, and that's what happened. He clotted his leg. He was going to lose his leg. So what we were able to do is cross this big aneurysm, put a stent in there, okay? And then after stenting it, we were able to uh, put clot busting medication. He was able to salvage his leg and he's still he's doing well. This is a cancer patient of mine who came in who was claudicating, meaning he, every time he walked, he had severe butt and thigh pain, okay? He just couldn't walk and calf pain. And so it was really debilitating. Couldn't even walk out of the block. He couldn't enjoy the remaining day, uh, days of his life in his existence. So what I was able to do for him was able to cross the blockage from above and below. Here's from the iliac, complete block, go from the femoral artery, go from the other femoral artery around the horn, make a channel, and then snare it with that catheter that I showed you and then put a metal, uh, metal stent to keep it open. So using all the technology of the people who invented this, I was able to get him to walk and enjoy the remainder of his life on that earth with at least you know, some quality of life. So it's quality of life and quantity of life. My goal is to give him a good quantity of life, but really more importantly, quality of life. So recognize that a lot of what we do is not only life and limb save, salvage and saving, but also quality of life improvement. These are some of the devices that uh, we use to kind of clean out clot. This is an older device, no longer available, but again, you should know what was available before so you can develop new things as you move forward. So we're, again, we're innovating and you can use this, the beauty of us, because we're working head to toe. We have this for one application, we can use it throughout the human body. That's cool. So this is an egg beater, the Traritol device. It's a, it's a Trebekian device. This is a double balloon device that kind of macerates clot as well. And this is a patient that I did at the, our old facility with my, one of my favorite nurses. Um, who This is a lady who had pancreatic cancer and Trousseau syndrome where you clot everything off. And in fact, she clotted her arm and clotted her porta vein. And what I was able to do is, and she had gangrene. This dead, this is her, her hand is dying from the clot. You can see the necrotic ischemic ulcer. What I was able to do is get this device out, suction the clot out balloon it, and she was able to save her arm, okay? Uh, we can do a lot of trauma. This is a patient that actually I just uh, uh, talked to recently, but this is several years, that was about eight years ago, and he had a Whipple for a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. It's a big surgery, and they can get this, what's called the uh, gastroduodenal artery stump blowout. This is not normal. So when I cross, I'm like, okay, I got a wire in. I did, it damaged one of these arteries, a little dissection. I'm like, oh, great, let me fix that. And then as I'm getting my sheath up, the first 10 flies, and then I see this. His pressure tanks, he's dizzy, he's about to code. And so I put a balloon up very quickly and I'm like, he's gonna die if we don't do something very quickly. Luckily, I was able to emergently get a graft in. This is the covered graft and he survived and he's alive eight years out, but he almost died on the table. So you have to be ready. Your adrenaline, if you're not an adrenaline junkie, this may not be a great feel for you because you, your adrenaline will definitely rise um, uh, several times during, the, during your career. 
Um, let me tell you about my experience. You know, I've always been passionate about teaching, and many of the uh, people on this call were my former uh, students. Uh, at, you know, and I can't wait till after COVID so people can come back. We often have three to five students, and this is my first ever medical student. He calls me. He says, his "Mom is at another Kaiser facility and is coughing up copious amounts of blood." Okay, I'm like, because she has carcinoma, which is a tumor of the bronchi, like of the lung. And I'm like, oh, you should get treated there. She's not stable for transfer. She stabilized her. He really wanted her to come to us. She did. So I come in at 6.30 in the morning in the ICU. He's sitting at the bedside. And next thing you know, she just vomits up, goes into arrhythmia and codes on, right in front of us. So intubated her, brought her down to interventional. And then we catheterized the artery and we shut it down. And uh, she survived, thank God. This was her. His dad, who was my patient before her mom, I always thought her mom was a healthy one. Her dad has, his dad had bad heart disease and arrhythmias and bad function. And so I did a cryoablation of his kidney tumor. And uh, that was uh, about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago. And they're uh, both doing well. Dad is cancer free and, I, and the mom is doing well. And I talk to them every year in follow up. Or I see them or talk to them every year. So, so it's pretty cool. My first ever med student, he actually ultimately went into interventional cardiology, but I think if he was here now, he probably would have chosen interventional radiology. So, I mean, you can't make these things up. It's crazy um, that, uh, you know, this is what I've been able to experience. We treat varicose veins, blockages of veins, et cetera. So this is a 55 year old who came from uh, Bakersfield. We had a meningioma, which is a benign tumor resected. They put an umbrella filter uh, and then he clotted his cavity. He couldn't walk. His Trees or legs were like tree trunks. The scrotum was swollen and his pain was so severe. Not only could he walk, not walk, he was an IV narcotics around the clock. So we took him over and this is looking at you from the front. This is your right kidney, your left kidney. This is the inferior vena cava and the iliac veins are all clotted down to the, to the, to the knee. So we access the neck put a big sheath in, access the other neck, put a return sheath in, we connect these two and it goes through this pump and we're able to, it's called a veno veno bypass. It flows at several liters a minute, okay, very high flow circuit, but we're able to suction the clot out. And this is what we got out, okay? Uh, tons of clot. And the best thing about it is within 24 hours, he was off of IV narcotics. He was able to ambulate for the first time in one month, five days after the procedure. And in his follow up, he did really well. This is a, a college professor. Uh, PhD, uh, who had um, had a filter placed for other reasons, had spine surgery, and then he had inability to walk. His legs were again like tree trunks, but this is more chronic state. And so we were able, like his everyone, his primary is like we'll call to reach out to surgery groups. There's nothing to do. Sorry, compression stockings. This the, this scientist was so miserable, and he reached out to his primary and go, Hey, can I see a vascular metric radiologist? And so that's how he came to me. I saw him. I was able to open up the blockage, stent him, and within 24 hours, he could see his feet and his toes. It was pretty impressive. And he was able to ambulate. He was actually able to bicycle. So he was able to, again, go from a wheelchair bound to functional. And again, there's bothersome things. We can help them. Life threatening things, we can help people. Unbelievable throughout the toe, from head to toe, throughout the body, from head to toe. This is a patient with a, a, who had a, a obesity surgery. They often historically put in prophylactic filters. And about two years after, it's just a vague belly pain, had a CAT scan. You can see this is the heart. This is looking like a loaf of bread slices. This is the liver. This is the heart. This is the right ventricle. And you can see this. It's very hard to see, but this little tiny little piece. Um, so I used to be, you know, these things can cause arrhythmias and perforation, what's called pericardial tampon, where the heart stops being able to beat. So instead of cracking the chest and taking it out, we decided to try to take it out in the from the femoral vein. And there it's grabbed with that snare. And see it come, 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 boom. That's it. This sharp piece, again, can perforate the heart and cause a lot of trouble. We were able to take it out in a very minimally invasive fashion without cracking the chest and having a sternotomy and putting it on pump. This is a kiddo who had Wilms tumor. Um, and unfortunately, the catheter, the port broke, or the catheter broke. When the catheter broke, it landed in the pulmonary artery. Again, to take a kid, to put them into heart surgery is a big deal. What we were able to do is instead of doing that, go through the femoral vein, into the IVC, into the heart, and grab it and pull it out. The cardiac surgeon was sitting outside 
why are you wasting your time? Just let me take an hour. I'm like, let me give me a chance. And uh, the team, we were, we all were so excited that we got this piece out, prevented him from going under heart surgery. And we were able to, um, everyone got so excited, they clapped at the end of it and moved this kind of piece of uh, material. Future horizons. I mean, uh, we're already already here now. Um, I know some of my friends like uh, Minaj Kaja have already traded the ascending. People are doing this in Europe. It's here. The future comes very quickly in our specialty. We're doing fenestrated branch and modified. So these are new devices and technology. Treatment hypertension, it came, it went, it's coming back. So renal denervation, just control that population. Prostatic interventions are novel treatments that we're doing now. Um, my colleague did one yesterday. Treatment of obesity is becoming popularized by, again, catheter-based technology, either freezing, freezing nerves or, or treating, blocking the vessels that make ghrelin, which is the things that makes you hungry. Treatment arthritis and musculoskeletal disorders is blooming. So many things that we can do now to fix, to fix ailments in the human body. Now, the key thing about this is it's really changed from a diagnostic field to a clinical and therapeutic field. So because of that, we can't train the way we used to. There are new training paradigms, new model practice. At our facility, we practice uh, holistic medicine. They, we all have clinic, we consult them and we follow them longitudinally. And many of my patients I follow for life and we become like family, okay? We have a huge array of team members and assistants and schedulers and nurses that help us manage our patients. We also have a robust inpatient consultation service, zero direct order entry for invasive procedures. And we go see the patient and make an assessment and guide them, counsel them. The other thing about what we did is we did a lot of innovation, but we have to not only innovate, but also validate what we do. And that's using level one evidence, okay? So the CORAL and the CLEVER trial were done by Tim Murphy from Rhode Island, where he you know, showcased that, hey, exercise actually works pretty darn well in claudications and in an area like population. Okay, this is the vascular and vascular radiologist to do that. Coral trial for renal artery stenosis did show that it didn't work so well to stent it. But again, this level and evidence, a track led Shresh Vedantam and now C-track, multiple trials looking at fibroids, okay? Prospective randomized control trials. Now we're fundamentally different than, you know, what historically med student, this is a med student's kind of survey from a smart map. And if you look at radiology at the far corner, antisocial, dark, visual, boring, reclusive, lonely, pale, technical, um, it doesn't describe what we are. We're surgical in nature, so fundamentally different. I think that's an important concept that students have to recognize. Why IR, minimum invasive, maximally effective, technologically driven, cowboys in medicine, think on your feet, patient-centered care, and it's surgical. This is very busy. We were, you know, Zayim can tell you all about our past week, but it is a new specialty because ABMS realized the importance of this. In order for medicine to transform quickly, this has to exist. It is now especially six years in integrated training from medical school, very similar to surgery, surgical internship. It's not like radiology, opto, anesthesia, derma, as far as lifestyle. It's a busy surgical specialty with a lot of emergencies. So we want to identify those who want to focus on patient care, have developed relationships with patients and do surgeries. These are a few of the uh, pearls, finding a mentor, uh, serve siweb.org, local mentors, get involved in research, and electives, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if you want to rotate with us. I know it's tricky with COVID, but hopefully we'll start to open up. Um, we fought hard and bought and I fought really hard to make membership free for medical students. It really annoyed me and irked me that it wasn't. And then we were able to fight and we got it free for you. So please take advantage of that and join. Um, Keys to success real quick, sub-internship in uh, vascular interventional three busy ways, do a vascular surgery block, do an ICU, take a screenshot of this, I encourage it. Surgical internship is key. ICU and continuity clinic throughout your residency training, okay? Tons of meetings that have uh, med students are able to go for free. So uh, again, here's my email, take a screenshot of this as well. This is me with the Dr. Bob who's gonna be giving the next talk. And this is that famous Laura Shaw and the SFA intervention. And these are the catheters they were able to use. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Dr. Ba, and for you the got, great talk on such an got. important topic. Um, I'd like to introduce the next moderator, Ty Madison, from, um, or a medical student at the University of uh, Washington. Thanks, Sydney. I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Kyle Cooper, currently works as an assistant professor of radiology of the, in the Division of Interventional Radiology at Loma Linda University in Southern California. 
He also serves the, as the Assistant Program Director of the IRDR Residency Program and the Assistant Director of Medical Student Education. This morning, we're gonna hear a great talk from him on, on vascular disease, predominantly venous disease. Dr. Cooper. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, sick. Um, so no camera today, because uh, I have been up for like 30 hours straight doing a couple GI bleeds overnight and I look haggard. So um, let's get started. Um, so this is what I look like, so you can burn that into your mind. Um, uh, this is me, what I'm usually doing on a Saturday, which is racing my bike. So we're going to be talking about veins today. Um, you know, after talking about arteries, veins, uh, you know, have the same layers as arteries, but they're thinner, less distinct walls. Uh, and the physiology is different, and the pathophysiology and the disease processes are different. You know, the uh, venous flow is dependent on the calf muscle pumping it back towards the heart. There's no heart pumping the blood down. So Blood flows from superficial to, um, to deep and between superficial veins through communicator veins, and there are valves present to prevent backflow after the muscle relaxes. It's important that we discuss the um, history of uh, when you're evaluating patients for possible venous disease. You want to determine whether or not they may have acute or chronic DVT, superficial venous thrombosis, or chronic venous insufficiency, meaning flow in the wrong direction or pooling of blood or occluded vessels, either in the superficial or deep system, uh, or masquerading or co coexistent arterial or lymphatic disease, which can sometimes be hard to distinguish. You know, patients with acute DVT are gonna have swelling, um, of course, uh, it's often associated with pain. For chronic venous insufficiency, it's often improved after the legs have been uh, above the level of their heart all night, laying in bed, and it's worse when they're on their feet. They say their calves feel tight, itchy or painful, uh, chronic fatigue. Um, Sometimes it can mimic arterial disease, like pain that improves with rest. Um, but the skin is often a different color, is often a different color in chronic conditions, like brown colored. Um, and they will uh, often have telangiectasias, reticular veins, sparta veins. I'll show pictures of these and slow healing ulcers, which are very difficult to treat. Uh, what increases the risk of clotting? Virchow's triad is basically the you know the what breaks down this entire long list. So venous stasis, blood's not flowing very well. Hypercoagulable thicker than normal and endothelial injury, the blood vessel is not normal anymore. People with venous disease, you look and see what the color is and with venous disease, often you'll see shades of pink, purple, and sometimes uh, uh, pale white or brownish discoloration in chronic disease, edema, skin uh, hardening, those varicosities that I mentioned, and um, you should always check to see if they have pre present or absent pulses, even if you know they have a DVT. Because sometimes you can have significant art, um, ischemia to the tissues that may also uh, involve the arteries in patients like these who have uh, phlegmatia cerulea dolans, which is a really extensive uh, clotting disorder, or alba dolans, where it's extensive clotting disorder that goes into the capillary bed and also affects the arterial flow. When you see these patients, you should see what degree of edema they have, both how deep you can pit it into the skin and how high the edema goes in the leg. And looking for signs of other conditions like lymphatic disease, like a positive stemmer sign seen here, which is present in lymphedema. Um, telangiectasias and reticular veins are shown here, and they're distinguished by their size. Um, in severe disease, you can have coronaphlebictasia, which is like a circle of these around the malleolus. And skin can change, and you can get stasis dermatitis and lichenification, like seen here. Or you can get fat atrophy, and you get these champagne configuration legs. Uh, this is lipodermatosclerosis, and another shade of it is shown here. Um, additionally, you can get uh, Atrophy blanche, um, which is a whitish discoloration, often in the center of these brownish areas. Venous ulcers are distinguished from arterial ulcers because they're often larger and they're in the medial and posterior calves, or also known as their gator region, and they're often wetter. Um, and the shallowness is uh, also another sign. You know, arterial ulcers often can get quite deep. They're associated with neuropathy and they might not be felt before they get pretty deep. Um, and we break these patients down with their uh, venous insufficiency into a variety of, um, we use the SEEP classification as one way. And obviously you're not gonna go through all of these, but it's just, you're looking at what are their clinical findings? What are their etiology uh, of the disease? What's the anatomy and pathophysiology? And you can classify each person using this rubric. Distinguish this from inflammation and acute clotting of the superficial veins, known as uh, thrombophlebitis. You can see this kind of reddish and painful veins in the superficial, uh, just under the skin. It can be palpated, often feels like a, a painful cord. And after it heals, in some patients, they'll get skin color changes like this. 
these patients need to uh, undergo some testing to determine, um, you know, what exactly is going on with their veins. So we usually use duplex as the first line screening tool for, for uh, veins. And what you're looking for is, is the vein collapsible? Because clot can be very dark on ultrasound. So, um, you know, here's an example of a patient who actually, you can see there's a little something going on in the blood vessel there. Um, but, um, you know, here's an example of, you know, you're just pushed down on this blood vessel and it just doesn't collapse, and that's their indicator that there's actually clot within the lumen of this vessel. Um, chronic clot becomes a little bit more echogenic on ultrasound. It can even become calcified, which is these whiter areas here. Sometimes it can even be so calcified it shadows, although that's rare. And as it re the body reabsorbs it, you can get long strands of uh, uh, partially recanalized uh, clot. Uh, it's really more scar tissue. It's not clot anymore, although it's often called chronic recanalized clot by sonographers. And in, you can look at waveforms of the blood vessels and say, uh, in a normal patient, they should have some variation in the spontaneous flow according to while they breathe. That If that's not present, it suggests there's something going on more centrally that's uh, preventing that from being transmitted from the, from the heart. Uh, additionally, the flow should be, as I said, spontaneous. And mild pulsatility is normal, but significant pulsatility above and below the baseline like this is not, and it suggests there may be something going on with heart failure or uh, systemic venous hypertension. And then when you squeeze the calf distally, uh, you should get some augmentation of flow if you're looking with ultrasound above it, but um, when you let go, there should only be a short amount of reflux. If you have reflux that lasts a very long amount of time, that suggests the valves aren't working the way that they're supposed to be. And for upper extremity veins, it's very, all, all that applies, but you also should have pulsatility in the central veins. That's, more, that's normal up in the chest. It's not normal in the legs. So uh, this patient is a 26-year-old woman with right upper extremity pain and swelling. Um, fit and active. She spends five to seven days a week in the gym. Past medical history otherwise is, is negative. She's on oral contraceptives, non-smoker. And she gets an ultrasound and shows she has acute clot within her subclavian vein uh, on the right side. And um, given that she has no real indication, other than being on oral contraceptives, she hasn't had any other reason um, for having clot. And uh, we suspected in this patient she was quite thin that maybe she had Paget-Schroeder syndrome, which is venous thoracic outlet. It's where the vein gets squished between the bone and the soft tissues uh, in the thoracic outlet. Um, so we did a venogram on this patient, uh, and you see that the flow is not going centrally. It's stopping, and there's a bunch of these small spidery collaterals um, that's trying to get the blood back to the heart. So in this patient, we crossed it with a wire, um, got into the central veins, and then we, in this patient, we placed a, a, a lysis catheter called an ECOS catheter, which um, drips in TPA overnight and also pulses in ultrasound to help it penetrate into the clot a little bit better, supposedly. And um, the next day afterwards, we did a repeat venogram. You can see there's better flow, but it's still not normal. Um, so we used a balloon in the area of stenosis. And um, once we got the balloon to expand, we repeat it. We see that in adduction, it actually looks quite a bit better. But uh, Paget-Schroeder is a bony compression. And if you, you do provocative maneuvers, you can actually close it down again. So this is the diagnosis right here showing that the vessel is closed when you turn the head to that side and you uh, abduct the shoulder. Here's ultras, uh, intravascular ultrasound image showing what it looked like when it was adducted and open after angioplasty, and you can see how narrowed it gets during adduction. Um, this patient went to surgery a few weeks later and uh, was doing very well six months later. So patients with clot, you know, the clot can migrate centrally and cause PE, as Dr. Vatican Cherry mentioned. You know, the uh, the gold standard for DVT is to put them on anticoagulation, but not everybody can be put on anticoagulation. So in some patients, we put in IVC filters. Now, these are originally permanent devices, and they went through huge sheets, but they become much smaller and smaller. Now they go through 5.5 French sheets at the smallest, and uh, they're retrievable, and they're no longer permanent like they originally were. And actually, some of them are convertible into stents, so a portion could be left behind to help hold the vein open if it's going to be left in long term. And how... Um, the filter is placed is basically you take the catheter and over a wire, you do some venography to identify the level of the renal veins. You then um, place the filter through the sheath and then you pin pull the sheath back off of it and it deploys the umbrella kind looking thing and that's to stop clots from going to the lungs. We want it to be nice and straight, not angled, it needs to be below the renal veins and we don't want it to be down in the iliac veins. Those are too small and you might increase the likelihood of clot. Um, after the filters are placed, they need to be removed when they're no longer needed. 
you should always check to make sure they don't have any active clot, particularly if they're not on anticoagulation before you take the filter out. You don't want to take the filter out and then send a clot to the lung. Um, and how the filters are retrieved is you go down with a, in the simplest terms, you go down with a little lasso um, and put it over the top of the filter. And once you've secured what's called the hook or the apex of the filter, then you're going to um, hold on to that and advance the sheath over and collapse the tines down. And then you just remove it and block. Uh, let's see if I can speed this up. I cannot. So the tine goes down. Secure it and then oversheat the device and you can remove it. Um, so if the filter's been in for a long period of time or if it perforates through the wall, it can be harder to remove. And so sometimes we Sometimes we require uh, additional techniques. You can actually bend these filters over uh, if you're ballsy. Um, and, um, uh, but typically, if the filter is not coming out, we'll use uh, additional techniques to um, get them out, which I'll show a few here. Um, this is a patient whose filter was left in only for two years, and it's kind of, you can see how the vein has gotten narrowed in their perforated strut. So what we did in this case, we couldn't get the hook over the um, apex, so we used a um, balloon to push it centrally, and that allowed us to get uh, get the filter out. Um, here was a patient who had tilted filter, and it was hard to get the get, get the hook over it. Um, so what we did is we pushed on the, or what they did is they pushed on the cable wall to center the filter, and then they were able to grab it. You can go under it with a catheter and wire, and that can allow you to do what's called a hangman technique and remove it. Um, Here's a patient who had an occluded upper IVC and they removed it from below. And then once they got it to the end of the sheath, they grabbed it from the other groin and removed it. If you have clot on the apex, you can still remove them. Um, I don't know where the rest of that image was, but typically you can suck the clot off and then remove the filter. Here's another example of a patient who had a filter in place. Um, they were unable to easily remove it, so they went under it with a hangman technique to remove it. And here's the intra-procedural images showing that. And then endobronchial forceps, which are my favorite and probably what I go to immediately, which uh, basically involves uh, using these alligator forceps, milking in two planes to make sure you're on it and grabbing it. And in this third image, you can see we actually have to grab it from both directions. It's a hard filter to remove. You can also use an eczema sh laser sheath to help you remove those, fil those type of complicated filters where you secure it from above advance the sheath, turn on the laser, and it helps to get that tissue off of the apex or off of the contact points, and then you can remove it without rupturing. So I know I'm almost out of time here, um, but I'm going to show a couple quick cases. Uh, this is a 19-year-old woman with severe left um, and moderate right lower extremity uh, pain. So she had a um, three-week history of lower extremity pain. Uh, she had a lysis of lower extremity DVT a month ago somewhere else and has recurred. So the ultrasound showed diffuse uh, clotting. These are non-compressible vessels. And we did a venogram, and you can see this is not normal. This kind of um, cloudy appearance um, of the vessel is, ab is abnormal, and then you can see that there's not a normal caliber vessel here. So there's clot throughout the IV throughout the leg vein and the, and the IVC. And on the other side, it was normal. This is what it should look like in the blood vessel, but there's an occlusion here in the iliac. Um, so what we did is we crossed the occlusions. We ballooned up the um, with a small with a relatively small balloon in the iliac system, an eight millimeter balloon, just to make room for us to put in a lysis catheter and we lysed the patient overnight. Then we brought them back the next day and um, from above, we brought the ca a catheter down and we tried to connect these two dots to one another, the, the above and below catheters. We had, when you do the venogram, you can see there's an obstruction here. And after um, using blunt uh, recanalization techniques, meaning not a needle, but just a wire and a catheter, we were able to cross from above and below and connect both sides to one another, and then slowly start ballooning everything up. You can see how narrowed it was before the balloon's fully inflated, and then it's fully inflated here. Doing the same on the other side, getting it through and through access from both sides now, and then putting in stents. And in this particular case, we had the stents all the way from up at the liver, so we're crossing the renal vein, so we use a larger intercity stent here called a Z stent to maintain access uh, to the renal veins and to prevent them from thrombosing potentially. And then afterwards, here's our completion uh, venograms showing good flow on both sides. 
and the patient did really well. Um, briefly, varicose veins can be treated um, for a variety of methods. You can do a vein ablation using either a laser or RF um, to uh, sclerose the inside of reflecting veins to prevent them from filling varicose veins, or you can glue those vessels shut, which is what I typically do now instead. If the varicose veins persist or painful or are bleeding, you can inject sclerosin into them directly to close them off. Or you can even do these. These don't require imaging guidance, but just sticking them with little tiny needles, these telangiectasian reticular veins on the skin and just blanching them with sclerosin. And they often will become inflamed for a day or two and then they go away. Um, so I am I had a couple more cases, but I'm also being paged right now. So I'm gonna cut it off of there. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm going to stay around for questions for Dr. Chick as well. Thanks, Dr. Cooper. I think just because we're a few minutes behind, we'll move to the next the next section. The next moderator is Alex Arn, medical student from Creighton University in Arizona. Thank you, Ty. Next, we have Dr. Jennifer Chick um, for the lymphatic session. He did his radiology and IR training at Harvard and Penn, respectively is currently an associate program director at the University of Washington, an expert in lymphatics, and has authored over 180 peer-reviewed papers. All right, thanks guys, can you hear me? Well, yep, yes. we can. Awesome, uh, thanks Kyle, that was an awesome talk and thanks all for having me today, it's an honor to be here. Um, so welcome from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, today it's snowing and pretty miserable out, but this is what it looks like uh, every day, it's uh, absolutely stunning and beautiful. So these are a couple of people I have to thank and some of my disclosures, obviously Kyle, uh, I've done a lot of work with him as well as uh, Ravi Trinivasa, who has taught me most things that I know. Uh, so this is a little bit of an overview of what we'll talk about. I'll talk a little bit about a lymphatic algorithm, uh, talk about some of the lymphatic variants. I'll show you some of the imaging techniques that we use for the lymphatics, talk about the standard antegrade or forward approach to lymphatic embolization, talk about retrograde or backwards approach to lymphatic embolization, show a little bit about stent graft reconstruction for the lymphatics, and finally show what the future holds. So this is what we think of when we think of the typical lymphatics. So the yellow here is the lymphatic system in general. Uh, so it originally originates from the lower extremities and arises up to the mid abdomen to this region we call the cisterna chile, which is essentially just a collection of lymphatics uh, that can join the legs the gastrointestinal lymphatics and the hepatobiliary lymphatics here. They then continue to rise up this structure called the thoracic duct, which typically dumps into the left side of the body at the jugulovenous angle up here in the neck. So there are a variety of causes uh, for injury to the lymphatics or diseases that affect the lymphatics in general. So the most common cause of injury to the lymphatics in general is surgical intervention, in particular thoracic surgery and even more so specific esophagectomy in general. But a variety of other surgeries, including abdominal and pelvic surgeries, particularly urology-based or uh, OBGYN-based surgeries, are known to injure the lymphatics as well. The lymphatics can be uh, damaged or injured or made leaky by a variety of malignancies as well. Uh, lymphoma is particularly common, but lung cancer is a close second. And then there are a variety of other smaller things, including congenital variants, such as atresia or malformed lymphatics, and a variety of systemic uh, diseases and infections that can uh, affect the lymphatics as well. So this is what I typically think of uh, when working up lymphatic patients, how to approach these things. Is the disease process either above the diaphragm or is it below the diaphragm? So if it's above the diaphragm, we think of uh, chylus fluid accumulated in the pleural space, a chylothorax, chylothorax essentially, chyloptysis, which is coughing up chyle. Uh, you can have a variety of lymphatic malformations in the chest. Then, and these things are best treated in a forward approach or an antegrade embolization approach. Well, if we have things below the diaphragm, which is uh, chylocytes or accumulation of chylus fluid in the abdomen, uh, various fistulas between the lymphatics and the bowel in the abdomen, or uh, the loss of protein in the urine or the uh, gastrointestinal system, these things are best treated in a retrograde fashion or a backwards embolization technique. And I'll show a variety of these as well. So this is the standard uh, lymphatics that we typically see. So we have the cisterna chile here, which is just a uh, large lymphatic sac here that then arises up the left side of the body and ultimately dumps into the left jugular venous angle, as you can see here. And this is just a uh, spot radiograph, which shows the thoracic duct here dumping into the left side of the body. This is the most common uh, form of it. 
but you can also have a variety of other forms as well, including a predominant right-sided lymphatic or right-sided thoracic duct, which uh, develops from the cisterna chile here, then arises to the right side of the body and then jumps into the right jugular venous angle. And you can see that here. So it's important to note that while it most often goes on the left, it can be on the right and not to be fooled. Uh, there are a variety of duplicated forms as well, uh, where you can have duplications in the lymphatic uh, system in general. This is a proximal duplication where you have these loops of the lymphatics. Here's another proximal uh, duplication here. And the important thing to recognize here is if there is a duplication, all these various limbs require treatment because if they're not treated or embolized properly, the patient will continue to have chylus leaks. There's also this dreaded plexiform variation, which is just sort of a spider web or a male formed uh, lymphatic system. And this is very difficult to embolize because there is no discrete or obvious lymphatic channel. Uh, and they can be very uh, troublesome when trying to treat patients. So there are a variety of methods to image the lymphatics. Uh, this is sort of hot off the press, new things that we're doing, uh, magnetic resonance lymphangiography, which is essentially injecting gadolinium into the lymph nodes of the groin and then uh, doing sequential MR imaging. And you can see leaks here very well. So this is a patient that has uh, engorged pelvic lymphatics here. And over time, you see accumulation of the contrast in the peritoneum here. And this is diagnostic of a patient with chylocystitis. Uh, this is another patient who on MR, you can see engorgement of the lymphatics here, and you really don't see anything up in the neck. And this uh, corresponds to the lymphangiogram here where there was complete truncation of the thoracic duct up here in the neck, uh, which was the cause of this ultimate congestion. So the variety of other techniques that can evaluate the lymphatics as well. Uh, this is using intravascular ultrasound, uh, which Kyle talked about briefly. So you can put an intravascular ultrasound probe in the lymphatics uh, right here, and you can vision, it's tough to see, but some disruption of the lymphatics up in this region here. This isn't used frequently, but it's certainly something that can be done. So a technique that's used in the coronary system is optical coherence tomography. And this is a high spatial resolution technique that can also be used to visualize the lymphatics. So here you can see the probe in the lymphatics here, and you can see on the OCT image here, you can see the disruption of the lymphatics. But far and away, the thing that we do most often to image and treat the lymphatics is lymphangiography. So this is the standard anterograde or forward approach that we think of. Uh, we inject the lymph nodes in the groin. We then use this oily substance called lipiodol, which is based from poppy seeds to opacify the lymphatics here. Uh, once the cisterna chile or this uh, conglomerate lymphatic is visualized, uh, we target the lymphatics here using a small needle, put a wire up into the thoracic duct, and then we coil and glue the thoracic duct uh, to treat any kind of leakages in the, in the chest. So this is the most common approach. This is what we do fre frequently to treat uh, chylos uh, effusion or chylothorax. So this are just some standard image. So we get into the lymph nodes of the groin uh, using a needle here. We then put that oily substance, lipidol, and opacify the lymphatics. It looks like little ants here. Uh, once the cisterna chile or some sort of retroperitoneal lymphatic opacifies, we target it with a needle. Uh, this is incredibly challenging. Uh, and it can take a great deal of time. We then pass a small wire up through the uh, lymphatic channel up into the thoracic duct. Uh, and you can see sort of the tortuous course here. And then ultimately we either glue it closed or we coil it closed uh, to prevent any kind of leak here. These are just some of the, some standard images here. The cisterna chile can be quite small. Uh, we target it with a needle here. Uh, we can glue it shut here, uh, or we can place coils at the distal part uh, so that the glue doesn't get into the venous system, and then we glue everything back here. Uh, so this is typically done in adults, but it can also be done in very small children. This is a 19-week-old child uh, doing the exact same thing, uh, advancing the microcatheter up in the cisterna chile here and ultimately gluing the, uh, the thoracic duct closed in a child here who had congenital heart disease and uh, tracheoesophageal fistula that ultimately resulted in lymphatic injuries. And here's just a corresponding case as well. This is something cool uh, that being done at University of Pennsylvania and some other places. This is a patient with chyloptysis or coughing up of chyle from an abnormal communication between the lymphatics and the bronchial tree. So on MR lymphangiogram, you can see this abnormal communication or this abnormal enhancement throughout the lung. On bronchoscopic exam, you can see the, if when blue dye is injected into the lymphatics, you can actually see it accumulating in the bronchial tree here. So ultimately we stuck this uh, case multiple times and glued this huge lymphatic malformation closed and the chyloptysis resolved. 
So that's the standard anterograde approach, but there's also a retrograde approach or a backwards approach to the lymphatics. And this is best treated for, and this is best used to treat chylocystitis or things below the diaphragm. So there are many ways to do this. One way is to stick the cisternochyle in an anterograde or forward approach, get a wire up and out into the arm, get venous access, snare the wire, and come down the arm into the cisternochyle. Another way to do it is to stick the thoracic duct with ultrasound or to stick it with fluoroscopy uh, are some common ways. So this is a retrograde approach, a transcervical retrograde under fluoroscopy in general. So you can see the thoracic duct uh, opacifying from uh, below here. And then we stuck it under fluoroscopic guidance directly with a needle, went down backwards down the thoracic duct, ultimately glued it shut and coiled it shut uh, in this patient, that patient of chylocystitis or chylothorax. So this is another one uh, where we came retrograde down the thoracic duct. Uh, you can see it opacifying here. We stuck it in the neck with a needle here, passed a wire down and coiled it shut uh, to uh, embolize the thoracic duct. This is one of my favorite patients that incorporates both venous disease and lymphatic disease. So this patient had a left upper extremity uh, venous outflow problem, uh, which resulted in congestion or backflow or injury of the thoracic duct. Uh, so ultimately what we did is we pressurized this region right here, the subclavian vein, and it resulted in the thoracic duct filling in a retrograde or backwards way here. We then stuck it under uh, fluoroscopic guidance, passed a wire down and embolized the uh, leak, which was right here. Uh, and then finally stented this region. So married sort of both my venous and lymphatic interests. So we can also stent graft the thoracic duct uh, in a retrograde fashion or a backwards fashion, where we stick the cisterna chyla, get a wire up and out, snare it from the arm and come backwards, and then place a stent graft from the neck in the thoracic duct to uh, preserve it. You can't really place a stent graft from the forward approach because when you do it forward, you go through a lot of other things like the bowel or even the liver or gallbladder, and it, the devices are too big to do it in a forward approach. So this is a patient who had an idiopathic left chylothorax right here, and on the pantogram had this plexiform uh, deformity here. So in a retrograde fashion, we went down, we put a stent graft with crosses to exclude it and completely excluded the leak here. This is a similar patient who had a heart transplant, uh, had a normal or relatively normal lymphatic duct here, but had persistent leakage. So again, we came in a backwards approach down the thoracic duct and ultimately placed a stent graft across this and the patient did well. So this is one of my favorite patients. This patient had a lymphatic malformation in the chest here that resulted in chylopericardium and the patient coded multiple times. So on lymphangiogram, you can see the leakage of chylus fluid into the heart cavity here, which resulted in this chylus effusion and uh, the coding episodes here. So again, we got across this uh, lymphatic lesion, came in a backwards way or a retrograde and placed the stent graft across it. And ultimately the uh, chylus pericardial effusion resolved and this patient at three years now is doing well. So there's also this technique called Borale, uh, which one of my colleagues, uh, Ravi, developed. And this is a backwards approach or a balloon occluded retrograde embolization. And this is an approach to treat chylocystitis. So essentially you come backwards down the lymphatic duct, uh, you blow up a balloon uh, in the lymphatic system and in a retrograde fashion, you instill sclerosin to sclerose all the pelvic lymphatics closed. And this is what works particularly well for chylocystitis. Uh, so this is a patient that had chylocystitis. Uh, came backwards down the uh, lymphatics here, put a balloon up in the lymphatics here. And when the balloon is up, uh, you can see all this uh, sort of distillation or dispersion of contrast throughout the entire peritoneal cavity. Uh, this was sclerosed using a detergent agent called sotradecol and the chylus society is resolved. This is CT several months later. You can see the detergent plug uh, here into the abdomen, which closed the leak there. This is a patient who had a traumatic uh, collection in the abdomen, uh, essentially a focal chylocystitis. So we came retrograde down the lymphatics here, blew up a balloon in the lymphatics, and when pressurized an injection, you can see the filling of the bowel here, and you can see the filling of all these retroperitoneal lymphatics here. So ultimately with the balloon up, we sclerosed this entire region, and this collection resolved, uh, and the chylocystitis resolved as well. So something kind of hot off the press and something that new people are doing or a lot more of us are doing now is the treatment of uh, focal collections or lymphocytes uh, using the embolization as well. So this is a patient that had a vascular surgery procedure and then developed a groin lymphocyte uh, right here. And so what we do is we inject the lymph node itself, inject a small amount of lipiodol until we see the actual 
lymphocele or focal collection. Then through the needle itself, we use very dilute glue and glue the collection closed here uh, and the lymphocele's typically resolve. So this is a patient that had a heart transplant and then afterwards developed this groin lymphocele. Again, we stuck this small lymph node, injected contrast here, and you can see the collection here, which corresponds to lymphocele. We ultimately glued it shut through the needle and the lymphocele resolved entirely. Finally, this is quite common here after OBGYN and uh, male uh, reproductive procedures as well uh, to get these groin lymphocele or this leakage in the in the uh, pelvis here. So again, you can do this uh, intranodal a technique where you inject the nodes themselves, inject the lapidal, and you can see the leakage here, here, you can see it on both sides. So ultimately we glued uh, these nodes shut or these lymphatic channels shut uh, from the groin here. And again, this, the chylocystitis resolved here and these focal lymphocele resolved as well. So lymphatics are extremely exciting and the uh, sort of world is our oyster here. There's so much more to be discovered uh, and we're treating a lot of patients in a different way. Uh, and this may lead to some very innovative techniques uh, such as lymphovenous bypasses in the future. So this is the first uh, case of lymphovenous bypass that we ever performed. Uh, so this is a patient that had uh, profound lower extremity swelling uh, from right uh, neck radiation. Uh, so on lymphangiogram here, you can see this congestion of these public lymphatics. You can see this leakage of uh, lapidol into the abdomen consistent with uh, chylocystitis. And this was all from an outflow obstruction from radiation in the neck. So the lymphatics were not dumping normally into the neck here. So ultimately what we did is we used a gun sight technique here, a snare up in the lymphatics from the abdomen, a snare in the neck here, uh, and use a gun sight technique where we line up two needles, uh, or two snares and a needle, and we connected the uh, upper part of the lymphatics here to the normal vein uh, using a stent graft, essentially restoring the uh, normal flow or creating a percutaneous lymphovenous bypass. Uh, so this patient's lower extremity swelling uh, resolved after making this lymphovenous bypass. And this is kind of, I think, a prelude to some of the things that can be done in the future. Uh, it's a really exciting field and uh, something that I think we should definitely all be involved in. So with that, that's a quick uh, overview. Obviously, a ton of information and there's way more out there. Uh, but this is a little bit of what we talked about. Uh, there's some great review articles if you're interested. And if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly email me. And again, uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Chick. In the interest of time, I think we're going to move on to the next section. So I'd like to introduce the next moderator, Austin Chinagawa from University of Nevada, Reno, who will be moderating the interventional oncology section. Thank you, Alex. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Heller. He completed his DR and IR training at UCSF and Northwestern, respectively, and joined UCSF as an assistant professor in IR in 2019. Um, Dr. Woodhead will be moderating our Q&A session. He's a VIR and also program director at the University of Arizona with interest in Y90 and interventional oncology. So with that, um, if you could please share your slides, Dr. Heller. Sure. <laughs> so thanks for having me. This is impossible to follow uh, the great Dr. Chick, but um, I'm gonna try. Um, so I'm gonna talk about interventional oncology. This is usually what gets a lot of people interested in IR. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna talk about liver-directed therapy because as you know, this is a huge field, uh, nothing to disclose. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about hepatocellular carcinoma, the treatment paradigm that's out there, different procedures that IR can do, and then give you some cases. Um, so you all probably know this, but hepatocellular carcinoma is the fifth most common cancer worldwide and the second most deadliest. Rates are steadily rising in the U.S., about 40,000 new cases per year. It initially was driven by hepatitis C and alcohol, but with the new hepatitis C drugs, uh, fatty liver disease is really contributing to um, this issue right now. A big thing to know, especially early on in your career, is HCC comes from cirrhotic livers. Uh, primarily. Uh, the only real caveat to that is patients with hepatitis B can have HCC without being frankly cirrhotic. And then patients who have cirrhosis have a, a pretty significant uh, risk of HCC every year, about two to four percent. So as, a as an interventional radiologist, you have to be a good diagnostic radiologist. And the key to diagnosing HCC is understanding each modality that you can see it in. 
So for patients who are cirrhotic at baseline who don't have known liver uh, cancer, uh, they're screened with ultrasound. And on ultrasound, you would most commonly just see uh, a mass within the liver and then go to one of these other modalities, that being CT or MRI with contrast. And the diagnosis of HCC is most commonly seen with arterial enhancement seen here. And then on a delayed phase, you'll have washout. Uh, it's better seen on this MRI, you have a uh, arterial enhancing tumor. And then on the uh, delayed phase, you have washout and then this enhancing capsule right here. So you probably have all heard about this. This is a fairly complex staging system, a BCLC staging system. The big thing to know is when we think about liver cancer, uh, are they early in their uh, disease process or are they later? Do they have a single lesion or do they have multiple? And knowing that will really help you decide, should we work for a curative method or do we have to think about something that's not curative and get them to transplant, hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna go over a little bit of the curative algorithm. So if you have patients who have a single HCC or three HCCs, uh, this is the early stage patients. And there are a lot of different uh, treatments that we can think about to get them to cure or get them at least to cure that tumor. So one being surgical resection, if they're good surgical candidates. Then where IR comes into play is percutaneous ablation. And this new not completely uh, follows the BCLC criteria, but what's moving towards that is radiation segmentectomy with uh, radioembolization. I'll get into that. But in patients who have HCC, there's always a risk of getting another one in patients who are cirrhotic. So the ultimate goal if you're gonna be doing some of these is getting to liver transplant. However, as you know, there are not as many livers as needed. So we're trying to cure them without getting them to liver transplant if possible. But knowing the idea if they have cirrhosis that they can have another HCC pop up in the future is really important to tell patients. Now going into the patients who have uh, more than kind of the early stage disease, we're talking about non-curative options. And the only cure in that, those patients is getting into liver transplant. So when you think about multinodular HCC, our goal as radiologists or interventional radiologists is trying to downstage them or bridge them to liver transplant. So downstaging is decreasing the tumor burden to within the criteria for transplant. And then bridging them is keeping them within that criteria without uh, over uh, having too many uh, liver tumors to get them outside of the liver transplantation, but eventually getting them to liver transplantation because you have to uh, cure their underlying cirrhosis. So the modalities that we have to treat uh, liver cancer, uh, one of them being thermal ablation. So that's done under ultrasound or CT guidance. Uh, what you do is you take these probes, they have a distal tip. The distal tip either has the ability to burn the tumor or freeze the tumor. The main one we use is microwave nowadays. It used to be, if you look at all the literature in the past, was radiofrequency ablation. And then some institutions use cryoablation or freeze the tumor. And studies have shown that this is very similar to surgical resection in terms of uh, long-term uh, effects in terms of survival in patients with HCC less than or equal to three centimeters. So here's a case, 55-year-old female with a two centimeter HCC. We can see in the preoperative MRI that same imaging uh, characteristics. So we have arterial enhancement and then washout. The great thing, especially the one thing I would tell a lot of trainees to kind of focus on is your ultrasound skills. Being able to place uh, these probes under ultrasound and visualizing um, the treatment under ultrasound is key because uh, you could really get um, really great placement of this probe. As you can see, actually, this probe is a little off center of this tumor, but we have the diaphragm there. So this was kind of more of a protective um, placement. And then actually what's very cool is with ultrasound, as you uh, actually burn the tumor, you can actually see this artifact. Um, and here's the post-ablation CT showing good tumor coverage. And this is the follow-up MRI showing no longer enhancement. So good treatment response. So, but the big thing that we really should talk about is intraarterial embolization. And so based on the imaging, you know that HCC is predominantly supplied by the arteries uh, from the hepatic arteries. So by, a, by being able to close off the artery supplying the tumor, in essence, you can possibly cause ischemia enough to kill the tumor. So when you think about that, there's three main techniques we can use. One, we can do bland embolization where we just put permanent particles and close off the vessels and hope that ischemia kills the tumor. 
The other thing is you can give localized chemotherapy uh, in the form of case uh, to close off the tumor as well as deliver chemotherapy or radioembolization. So a little bit about the technique. So the main way of doing this is accessing the uh, femoral artery in the upper thigh, or you could go over the radial artery. Uh, I prefer the femoral artery, but whatever you're comfortable with. Then you take the equipment into the uh, celiac access or whichever vessel is supplying the tumor. And then uh, under x-ray guidance, you get further more distal into the vessel supplying the tumor. So here's a case. We have a uh, segmentate or hepatic dome mass. And this corresponds to this celiac angiography demonstrating the hypervascular tumor in the hepatic dome. Here we have that celiac angiogram again. And so by taking multiple projections, you can figure out which vessels are supplying this tumor. This is a more selective uh, uh, run where you're taking the microcatheter out of the base catheter. What we use is cone beam CT to identify the tumor and what uh, normal parenchyma you'll be treating at the same time. You get more selective with the microcatheter and then deliver the embolic. In this case, this was chemo uh, embolization. So a little bit about bland embolization. Big things to know. I'm not going to go into all the different particles and everything, but it's permanent particles or beads. They look like this. There's a lot of different ones. Um, and the whole idea is you deliver uh, into the vessel and the uh, distal vessels of the uh, tumor vessels and you close them off. And the whole idea is you cause ischemia and you kill the tumor that way. And here's a case here. This is a 75-year-old male with a bleeding HCC. So we have this huge uh, segment eight tumor with arterial enhancement. Uh, here's the celiac run again. We see the tumor up here. Uh, we get more selective, see so the tumor staining. But the interesting thing to note is we only see the inferior margin of the tumor. So actually the top part of this was actually supplied by the phrenic artery. And so we eventually treated that as well. And here's the follow-up CT. This was all after bland embolization. The main one we're gonna talk about is transarterial chemoembolization. So you all probably have heard of TACE. And so there's two main agents uh, that we perform taste with. Either we do conventional taste, which is chemotherapy with lapidol. And I know Dr. Chick was talking about lapidol and there were a lot of questions about it. Uh, lapidol is like poppy seed oil, or it is poppy seed oil. And it has a lot of great properties for uh, a lot of the interventions we do. One of them being, you can see it under um, X-ray because it's radio dense. The other thing is it uh, has been studied and actually preferentially goes to tumor and stays within uh, liver tumors, which is great. And then also it conforms to the vessel size. So it can actually get uh, clogged up into, go past the arterioles and go into the portal venules and cause an embolic phenomenon too, which I'll discuss a little bit later. And then you have deb taste, which are chemotherapy laden beans, beads. And the whole idea with that is you um, deliver these beads and the chemotherapy slowly leaks from the beads and delivers chemotherapy over a longer period of time. And the mechanism of TACE is increased local concentration of chemotherapy. So instead of giving systemic uh, chemotherapy and having the systemic effects, you're able to give a high dose of chemotherapy directly to the tumor. And then also you have the ischemic uh, mechanism similar to bland embolization uh, with deb TACE and conventional TACE you follow with either uh, permanent embolic or gel foam, a temporary embolic. And this is how you form uh, conventional taste. You mix the chemotherapy with the lapidol um, back and forth until you get a mixture. Here's a case of transarterial chemoembolization. We have this tumor here. And what you can see, and I'm going to zoom into this, you can see the portal venules. And that's pretty much how you know. You see staining of the tumor. And then what we have is we have the uh, chemotherapy going in, into the arterioles, into the tumor, and then into the portal venules. And you have complete tumor uh, coverage of that area. And so that's what you're really looking for, uh, this one as well. So a little bit of, about transarterial radial embolization. This, each one of these is a whole topic in themselves, uh, but with only 10 minutes, I can't go into everything. But uh, this is the, the, the hot new uh, treatment uh, for liver cancer, both in that curative uh, setting, and then also in the uh, more non-curative and bridging setting. So the two main agents, there's resin and bead coated with radiation. 
and it has minimal occlusive properties. Some say resin has a little bit more occlusive properties, but the newer um, way of delivering it is less common. But the whole idea of mechanism for this is high dose local radiation and letting the radiation kind of settle in the tumor. So for the curative modality, which you probably have all heard of is radiation segmentectomy. The fantastic thing about radiation segmentectomy is we can give high doses radiation to a very small area of liver and in essence, kill that both the normal liver parenchyma and the tumor at the same time, causing a radiation uh, surgical segmentectomy. So very similar to a surgical resection in theory. So here's the preoperative MRI. We have an arterial enhancing tumor. We see that on the uh, planning angiography. So here it is, and we see the normal liver parenchyma here. We confirm with cone beam CT. So the interesting thing about uh, Y90 in comparison to TACE, TACE uh, predominantly is done uh, in a single session where you admit the patient overnight to make sure they're doing okay. Uh, it, we're moving to more of a outpatient setting for TACE. Uh, in very select patients, but still there is practice to watch them overnight just to make sure that they don't have any um, signs of liver decompensation in the short term. But the beauty of Y90 is both of these procedures, both the planning and the treatment are outpatient procedures. So what we do is we do the planning session. And then what we do is we, during the planning session is we deliver uh, MAA, tech MAA, which is a test dose of radiation, I like to tell patients. And it's a, in theory, seeing where the radiation would go if we were to treat from that level. With radiation segmentectomy, I usually don't deliver the uh, test dose of radiation really distally. I actually go proximally. Just in the possible cause, I would actually occlude those vessels and can't get back to them later. So here is the um, spec CT. So after you deliver the MAA and you're close up the patient and you send them to nuclear medicine, you do a uh, spec CT. And so what that's looking for is for the technetium MAA that you delivered. And what you can see here is the uh, enhancing tumor here. And then you can actually see where the radiation would go. And it would go into this liver parenchyma and actually the intestine. So always keep in mind this. The only reason that we see this is because I delivered it very proximal. But if I were to deliver it here, it would only be in this small area. And you can confirm with cone beam. Then you bring the patient back, you place the catheter right where you want to deliver and deliver a high dose of radiation. And this is what the post-op MRI shows, not enhancement of the tumor. Now, when we're talking about multiple lesions, and this is really where uh, Y90 initi initially came out, it was mainly for portal vein invasion and also low bar treatment. So this is a low bar delivery of Y90. And the main reason for this is, as you can see, there's multiple uh, hypervascular tumors within the right lobe, which you can see pretty easily on this right hepatic run. Cone beam CT will help you demonstrate which vessels uh, supply what tumors and to make sure that you're not, you're not delivering it extra hepatically. And here's the spec CT after the testosterone irradiation or tech MAA was delivered. And you can see uh, pretty significant uptake. So that's the orange or yellow part of the MAA and tech MAA going to the tumors primarily and less so to normal liver parenchyma. And this is what we do. And I do this with all trainees and you should really get into practice of actually calculating volumes and figuring out how to order the uh, radiation. And then you bring the patient back, you deliver it from the right hepatic artery. And so this is a post-operative CT. This is a little early. And that's important to note that it actually can take uh, months. It can take three, six, sometimes 12 months to really see the full effects of the radiation. But you can see some of these non-enhancing tumors that were previously enhancing. Some of them have show, show some uh, changes of necrosis, but not complete. Uh, it's still a little bit early. I think this was only done about a month to month and a half afterwards because this was more tumor staging. Um, so it's really important to hold your horses that uh, it, it can take a little bit longer to see the full effects of radiation. So this is, that was a cursory overview of interventional oncology regarding the liver. There are a million talks and there's a million ways to kind of go into it. But I think the real exciting thing is interventional oncology is really an important field in cancer therapy. And we're only talking about liver-directed therapies. We're not talking about uh, renal cell carcinoma, 
or what's kind of becoming a bigger thing is actually uh, painful bone metastases, doing ablations of that or ablations of other things, which are really cool. Uh, the real other important thing is a lot of people get worried about uh, interventional oncology or intervent going into interventional radiology because you won't have longitudinal patient care, but interventional oncology, you really can. You can see these patients for years and years. Uh, multidisciplinary discussion and approach is key to success. So going to the tumor boards, especially as a trainee to understand what people are looking for and how the treatment paradigms are shifting uh, is really important. And future of cancer therapy will continue to depend on IR, which is really cool and really tells you in terms of job security, uh, this is the right field to get into. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you for that great introduction to Liver IO, Dr. Heller. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next section, which will be moderated by Taylor Rasmussen, a med student at the University of Washington. Thanks, Austin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce everyone to Dr. Katravesis. Dr. Katravesis is curr currently serves as a medical director for the Division of Vascular and Interventional Radiology at the University of California, Irvine. We are very excited to hear him speak to, to us today about portal hypertension. Dr. Katravesis. Hey everyone, sorry, no video, but can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, let me uh, launch the screen here. All right, uh, how's that? Can we see it? Uh, not yet. All right. There's a little green share screen. Um, All right. How about now? Yep. Okay. So thanks for having me, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is James Catravesis, uh, UC Irvine. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know where we're at, we're in Orange County, California. Uh, hospital is actually right, right across the street, basically from the uh, Angels Ballpark, and. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about portal hypertension. It's a huge topic. Uh, we'll try to uh, go through the basics here, but as you all know, there's a ton of procedures related to portal hypertension, all these confusing acronyms. So we'll try to just sort that out, okay? Um, but you, you know, first off, you need to understand portal hypertension. You need to understand the physiology. You need to understand the anatomy like anything else if you're gonna do it right. So, um, you know, if you look, if you think about your anatomy, you've got a portal vein here, your splenic vein, SMV and your inferior mesenteric vein, okay? Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, you know, when, you, when a patient gets cirrhosis, for example, uh, there's, uh, there's an outflow issue. And it's like anything else, uh, whether it's arterial work, whether it's venous work, you have to think about inflow and you have to think about outflow. So, you know, with cirrhosis, you have an outflow issue. Blood can't get through that stiff liver. You also have increased inflow because of arterial or um, dilatation. So, it's, it just makes it bad from both sides. Uh, you increase that portal hypertension and then bad things happen. These varices develop from off the left gastric or the coronary vein. You get uh, esophageal varices. You get gastric varices from the, uh, off the splenic vein the, in the short gastrics. You can get other varices elsewhere. We'll just kind of concentrate on these. So there's three basic types of portal hypertension. The pre-sinusoidal is really when you get a portal vein thrombosis, uh, they can get ascites and varices. And uh, you can also get narrowing here, stenosis from, uh, let's say a pancreatic mass, uh, narrowing that area. That's the kind of thing you might go in and just and do a portal vein stent, okay? Most commonly though, you're gonna get a sinusoidal um, a cirrhosis um, that limits blood flow through the hepatic sinusoids. And that's our really uh, typical thing that we see. Post sinusoidal is a little more rare. Uh, the bud chiari where you have an outflow issue in the hepatic veins. Um, but the bottom line is that wh whatever the cause, when you get an increase in portal pressure, that's when you develop ascites. Uh, a normal gradient uh, between the portal vein and the hepatic vein is, should be around two to five, okay? Once that gradient is above 12, you start having complications. If that gradient stays below 10 or 12, they usually don't get bad varices and they don't get bleeding. Uh, medical management, these patients, you know, to try to prevent bleeding is usually 
uh, beta blockers to uh, try to keep that uh, portal pressure down. So like with any upper GI bleed, endoscopy is gonna be the first line of approach, okay? And I know this video has been out on the internet. Uh, it's just very, uh, uh, you know, when you see up close what these varices bleed like, it's, it, you can get an idea of why these patients can be so unstable. This is a video of, of a gastric varix that's just bleeding out. So um, again, it's endoscopy is where we start. We wanna know what kind of varices they have, whether it's esophageal, whether they're gastric. The endoscopist can treat these. They do banding, they inject adhesives, uh, sclerosis directly into the varices. Tends to work pretty well for esophageal varices, not so great for gastric varices. They really don't have a good option to treat uh, gastric varices. They're larger, they have higher flow. And so that's where we come into, especially with the gastric varices. So one thing to keep in mind is that there's some very uh, aggressive endoscopists out there. Uh, our guys are measuring portal pressures now via EUS. And there's even been studies um, in animals where they've tried to do uh, a tips basically through an EUS guided punctures. So just something to keep an eye out for. Once endoscopy basically fails, you move on. Uh, there's tips and then there's dips, okay? This is our classic kind of procedure, the, the tips, where we're connecting the, generally the right uh, portal vein to the right hepatic vein. And, you know, you can have all sorts of other combinations, left portal vein and, to, uh, you know, it, but the typical standard bread and butter tips is right portal vein to right hepatic vein. And it's all about decompressing the portal system, decreasing that portal pressure. A dips you may have heard of is a direct connection basically between the IVC and the main portal vein. You go through the caudate lobe. Uh, it's a good procedure to know how to do. If for example, someone has say an occluded tips and you can't reopen it, they, have, they just don't have the anatomy. There's a, there's a, there's a mass in the way, something like that. Um, to do it though is complicated. You need to be able to use an IVIS or an ice catheter, which I'll show you in a minute here. Uh, but once you have that, it's actually pretty straightforward kind of procedure to do. <clears throat> now, this is just a case of a bread and butter tips of a, of a patient. She actually came down, uh, uh, coated on the, getting out to the table. Uh, probably because if you see this very misplaced uh, Blakemore tube, uh, we fixed that and then she was a little more stable. We went ahead, uh, got our uh, standard tips. This is the dual injection we do between the hepatic vein, portal veins. So we can measure our stent length. We put our stent in uh, and, and it looks beautiful. So that's just kind of a very, you know, normal kind of tips. This is a case I had actually just Monday of this week. Um, uh, similar situation. We do a kind of a standard tips approach. We are into the hepatic vein here. We do a CO2 venogram to light up the portal vein. We can see the right and left main portal veins. We get our access to our venogram, massive. Uh, coronary vein, all these esophageal varices. <clears throat> Final picture here, we've got a nice stent uh, running through here. Now, if you notice though, there's another sheath right here. So I wanna explain what that is. <clears throat> so this is an approach that um, I actually didn't have in, my, in training, but I use it now. So it's one thing to keep in mind is that in training, you know, you're gonna to wanna to learn solid fundamentals and then you can pick up other things along the way. For example, this technique, of using this intravascular ultrasound for uh, tips, uh, I picked up as an attending and, and I love it, it works, works really well. So if you'll notice, we've got our sheath in the, hepatic, in the hepatic vein, we've got another sheath coming up, we've got this probe here. This is a ice catheter. It's not your standard IVUS, it's an intracardiac um, ultrasound. It's a side firing uh, catheter, uh, the probe. Um, so you can see your liver in just beautiful detail. These are actual pictures from that case. Basically here, we're looking at the hepatic vein and my sheath is sitting there, portal vein here. You can actually see the needle coming into the portal vein. These are usually one stick, a two stick tips and it's very safe. It's very easy to use. It can take a little longer to set up but once you start using it, it, it actually works very nicely. And I really like this approach. Um, even if you have a, uh, a thrombose portal vein, you can, you can get into it using this technique because you can see it in real time. <clears throat> so let me move on now to the BRTO, PARTO, CARTO. You might've heard of all these different procedures. This is a different approach altogether, okay? This is when we're dealing primarily with gastric varices. Um, this procedure works great if you have either isolated gastric varices or you have very uh, minimal, low-risk esophageal varices. Um, 
because what happens is you have this large shunt that you're going to include with the procedure. You're going to make the portal pressure go up. If you have high risk esophageal varices, they're just going to get a lot worse. However, for a patient that has big gastric varices, again, not a good, any good options with endoscopy to treat these. You can uh, uh, fix this with a BRTO. So what is a BRTO? Um, you have to understand that to do this procedure, you have to have a shunt. The shunt almost always comes off the left renal vein and connects into these varices. If that shunt doesn't exist, this procedure's you know, pretty much off the table, unless I guess if you got very, very uh, extravagant and kind of off-road with it. But the BRTO, PARTO, CARTO, the difference is what you're plugging this outflow with. So these patients have reversal of flow in the portal vein. So you imagine blood flow is going this way, going through their gastric varics, coming back out through the renal vein and back up to the IVC. So the first step is you have to plug this outflow and then you backfill a sclerosant all the way backwards through the system here to take out these varices. And so the, the difference of all these techniques is what are you plugging this outflow with? So the BRTO, which I don't do, did some in training. I don't know if a lot of people do it as much anymore. They put a balloon up here, occlude the outflow, they backfill the sclerosant. Um, when they first started doing these in Japan, they actually sent the patients to the ICU overnight with this balloon up and came back the next day and took it down. That doesn't work so great. It uses a lot of resources. Uh, and so what then I tried next is um, called a parto, where we're actually plugging this outflow with a, an Amplatzer plug. You plug the outflow, you put another catheter up above it, and then you backfill all these varices with uh, just gel foam. Gel foam works awesome. The most important thing to remember is that you have to backfill all the way back. If you stop short and you don't get enough in here, you've actually made the situation a lot worse because you plug this outflow, you've made the pressure going into the system much higher, and then these are gonna rupture. So you have to be very careful that you really go all the way and plug these up. So a, a BRTO, use a balloon to occlude this. A, a parto, you, you occlude this with an Amplatzer plug. A carto, you do it with coils, which is kind of the way I, I do it now. So if I can show you on this coronal uh, scan here, this patient has esophageal, uh, uh, sorry, gastric varics. He had a big shunt coming off his left renal vein. We come down here, get into the left renal vein, get into the shunt. We have a little microcatheter we send up as far as we can into the shunt. That's gonna deliver the gel foam. We have our other catheter here, our base catheter. Put a ton of coils in here, occlude this outflow, backfill the whole system with gel foam. Uh, what I like to do is do a cone beam at the end, make sure I've really gotten all these gastric uh, varices filled and I'm, that I'm, I'm happy with the, uh, with the outcome. A parto, there's another patient, uh, shunt here, coming up, getting into the shunt, get a sheath. If you can see the Amplatzer plug right here, we've got our catheter, same as the other procedure. We deploy the, the plug and then backfill all the, all the uh, varices with gel foam. This technique is nice. However, sometimes based on the angle and things like that, the size of this outflow, sometimes it's a lot of uh, work to get a sheath up there to deploy the plug. So I'm not as big a fan of this anymore. I really prefer the CARTO technique uh, with the coils. I just like that a lot better. Okay, so that's all I had and uh, hope that was helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ketravesis, for the intro into the treatment of portal hypertension. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll keep moving on um, to our next session. Sabine Shakya is a current medical student at the Medical College of Georgia, and he will be moderating the MSK section. Thanks, guys. Hello, everybody. My name is Sabine Shakya. Uh, I'm a medical student at the at Medical College of Georgia, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Douglas Beal. It's going to be presenting on some interventional MSK procedures. Uh, Dr. Beal currently works in private practice in Oklahoma. Uh, he completed his DR residency at John Hopkins and an MSK fellowship at Mayo Clinic. He's a prolific researcher as well as an avid mountaineer, and he has a website if you want to learn more about him, drdouglasbeal.com. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and switch it over to his presentation.
Thank you very much, Saban. It's a pleasure to be with everyone at the symposium, and I'd like to discuss with you uh, about vertebral compression fractures and some of the new tech. I'm Doug Beal. I'm an interventional radiologist in Oklahoma City. I'm in private practice, and I'm the author of the recently released uh, Comprehensive Guide of Vertebral Augmentation that was released this, this past year. So I want to talk with you about new stuff, new tech today, and uh, the things that will um, be, you'll be looking at in the future, hopefully none of which you have seen yet, maybe a couple of the elements I will talk about. First, I'd like to talk about vertebral augmentation with the implants, and this is primarily due to and using uh, the techniques to treat unstable vertebral compression fractures. And one of the upcoming uh, techniques that we've been recently working on is screw-assisted internal fixation or the SAFE uh, procedure. But first, we want to talk about the spine jack. This is a pivotal trial that happened uh, years ago, uh, four years ago in Europe. It's 15 investigators at 13 sites, and this was a pivotal trial for the spine jack. And it compared pain function in terms of primary points along with safety and then quality of life as a secondary endpoint. <clears throat> 141 patients. The spine jack, which is an implant augmentation shown here versus balloon kyphoplasty. And so the this difference in terms of height restoration, I'll show you two other differences, showed statistically significant superiority in a non-inferiority trial compared with the balloons. A very difficult task to do, especially in a non-inferiority trial. So this was significantly better. Height restoration is seen in the mid vertebral body height restoration. This to me is probably the most important difference was a significant reduction in adjacent level fractures. And in fact, it was able to modify the native incidence of fractures. The fracture after uh, a vertebral compression fracture is about 20% even in the non-treated. And this reduced it to a uh, little over 12%. So this is significant reduction, eight patients with 12 fractures after one year as compared with 18 pa patients and 26 fractures in balloon kyphoplasty. So not only did it uh, reduce better, showed less adjacent level fractures, but it had a better pain reduction score. So it was actually produced less pain, which is really impressive because you have to have something that has a lot less pain to be able to show a statistical significance as compared with balloon kyphoplasty. So what implants need uh, the greatest amount of film material, the greatest amount of protection of the posterior wall is these. So this is a complex fracture. This is Magrel A3.3 fracture. We'll go over those classification system in a second. But this is shown to be treated with cement. Uh, in my view, this is not quite enough cement. The, the element of the vertebral body at greatest risk of fractures, that posterior wall. And so if you've never seen these happen over time, they probably have happened and it's not been noticed. Uh, if you've not seen it, they pro probably have seen you. So this is associated with a greater degree of difficulty because of the retropulsion of the posterior wall. And the greatest amount of stress, in fact, is the middle column. So as you fix the anterior uh, two thirds of the vertebral body and something that has a vertebral compression component to it, the greatest amount of stress by far is on the middle column. And what happens or can happen over time is not only fracture of the incident level, but adjacent level fractures here, as is demonstrated as I've shown you. This is uh, prophylactic level treated below the area of the T2 or the L2 fracture. And this is also uh, has developed an adjacent level fracture. So what types of fractures should be treated with the greatest amount of stabilization? Uh, probably the greatest amount of stabilization is the implant augmentation. So fractures with a high degree of fragmentation like this. Anything that involves a posterior wall is magral A3 fracture. And a complete uh, comminution, a burst fracture from top to bottom is a magral A3 uh, dot three fracture. And so high degrees of fragmentation. Uh, this one is an A3-3 fracture or using the AO classification, this is known as an A4 fracture. And so this is just dust. I mean, there's air present within a very highly fragmented fracture. And this one is a a large cleft. Any fracture with a large cleft is a snake in the grass, and these things can be very unstable. It can be very difficult to treat because you have to use a lot of cement. Uh, often combine this whenever we had balloon kyphoplasty with uh, bracing, uh, even after kyphoplasty for six weeks, to get these to hold together, primarily because the pedicle somatic fractures that often accompany these very comminuted fractures. And so most of the interventionalists will say, 
and spine surgeons say you can treat magral A1 and A2 fractures percutaneously. A1 fractures are non-burst fractures that involve the superior portion <clears throat> and sometimes the middle portion of the vertebral body. But A3 fractures involve the middle column, meaning the posterior wall. And um, many authors, many clinicians will say that surgery should be reserved for these fractures along with B and C fractures, which are fracture dislocations at C fracture and, and uh, flexion distraction, which are B fractures. And so this is from Mercer's book of orthopedics uh, that reserves uh, surgical treatment for Magrel A3 uh, fractures and some A2 fractures and reserves um, kyphoplasty percutaneous treatment for some of the other more stable fractures. So what, what do we need to do? Do we need to jump directly to stabilization of the posterior column? We often see this, uh, how well does that work? And this is uh, part of the Italian lab produced this, and this is uh, deformation of the superior end plate after fracture. The fracture is located, second one from your left in the purple. And so after you have a fracture, you have a fairly dramatic excursion of the superior end plates. Then the um, third one from the left there is, is pedicle screws. And the pedicle screws and spanning rod construct doesn't really change the movement of the superior end plate that much. The next one to the right is an incident level uh, uh, vertebroplasty with same level screws followed by spanning screws and vertebroplasty followed by implants and screws. And the one on the right is uh, implant and spanning pedicle screws. So what's necessary? Do we need to go from, because spanning pedicle screw and rod doesn't support the fracture that much, do we, what do we do? Do we go all the way to the support with the greatest construct? And this is called a pedicle jack. Um, nobody's seen this before because it's just been tested in labs. And this is a uh, intra-body uh, fracture fixation with a spine jack associated with spanning pedicle screws and rods. And so is it, do we need to go to the greatest amount of, of support just by jumping Jumping all the way to the end, or is there something that we can do at the incident level? And this is an incident level vertebral body stent with screw back up to bridge the middle column. And this is called screw assisted internal fixation. And so this is the second greatest stable construct, but notice that this is an incident level fracture treatment only. There's no spanning pedicle screws and rod construct that is necessary. There's no great amount of stabilization that's necessary. And this can be done either with an implant or with a spine jack, as I showed you in combination with pedicle screws. And in fact, these can be treated uh, the incident level alone as a standalone with spine jacks. Stefano Marcia in our book, uh, the chat, the tricks and tips from around the world in uh, segment 35.9 did a whole section on treating uh, comminuted co complex spine fractures with spine jack only. As I mentioned, the Magrel uh, uh, classification is the standard one along with the AO classification used for fractures. And this is demonstrating A1, 2, and 3 fractures, top row, middle is B, and fracture dislocation is C, as I mentioned previously. And then burst fractures are the ones that involve the posterior column. So in treating fractures that are complex and fractures that are unstable, ligament ataxis can reduce that posterior fragment as long as it can pull the posterior fragment anteriorly and reduce the retropulsion as long as the posterior longitudinal ligament is intact. And spine jack has a unique characteristic as opposed to osseofix or tectona of having a cranial caudal distraction. And this can pull the fragments and using ligament ataxis can reconstruct the vertebral body. And in fact, this has been done numerous times in uh, Magalay 3.3 fractures as a standalone. And there is actually data supporting this. And this is the most recent paper that was just accepted a uh, paper I did with uh, David Noriega out of Spain. And this is 44 consecutive patients with Magrela 3 type fractures that were treated with standalone spine jack. And this was followed out to an average of 5.6 years. Pain function uh, was measured along with radiographic uh, height restoration and radiographic uh, normalization of the fracture. And this maintained itself, not only that, but the pain and function maintained itself over an average of 5.6 years for long-term follow-up. So here's just kind of a technique. You have to mine the access and come in very flat. This is different than the typical kyphoplasty that you come in uh, from top to bottom. And so you just mine the access, placing this along 
with the needle with the wire, K wire followed by the drill, followed by the implant. In this case, this is a vertebral body stent and the reduction, progressive reduction, prophylactic levels if you so choose, cementation, and finally, the incident level screw fixation. And this is backed up with lots of literature. This is literature on screw assisted internal fixation. And we choose to do this in terms of uh, reduction and maximizes reduction and indirect canal decompression, as I mentioned. It decreases the strain in the superior end plate, which probably accounts for the less adjacent level fractures. And it's to be used in severe osteoporotic fractures and severe fractures with extensive lytic lesions and prominent vertebral body lysis. And so the combination of the least invasive and most stable type of construct is indeed the screw in assisted internal fixation. So in the bottom line is implants are better for fracture reduction, better for stabilization, and should be used for severe fractures and fractures that involve the uh, structural integrity of the vertebral body itself. It can be, they can be used as a standalone uh, all the way out to uh, A3 type fractures, but can also be used in terms of a combination with screw. And the combination of the greatest amount of stability with the least amount of invasiveness is indeed the screw assisted internal fixation. So and my conclusions for this is vertebral augmentation is one of the best things we do and has overwhelming literature support for it. And hopefully I've shown you some next level stuff to raise your game and to be able to treat all fractures, not necessarily the ones that are just the A fractures, but the more complex and more involved fractures. And my parting message to you is do more vertebral augmentation. You will love it. And I appreciate that. I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments. And thank you very much for your attention. Hey, wow, thank you very much, Dr. Beal, for that presentation. He actually is uh, live in the chat right now. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer over to our next moderator, Lindsay Arndt, who's in her final year of her MD MBA at Emory University. Thanks, Aiden. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Miles Conrad. He's a clinical professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. And he's gonna tell us about trauma interventions. On the chat for this, we also have Dr. Biramar Muthi, who is an assistant professor in clinical radiology at Los Angeles County and USC Medical Center. Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, Miles Conrad here. I'm on a family vacation on the Oregon coast and uh, the only place I can be quiet uh, without the screaming kids is in this van. So <laughs> I'm giving this talk from a van out here. Um, but anyway, that's, that's why it looks weird. But, um, but anyway, I wanted to talk to you today about the use of gel foam in uh, trauma. And um, I've always been fascinated by gel foam. We use it all the time. It's really the only widespread uh, temp use temporary embolic. It's very cheap and um, we should uh, devote some time into it. So I hope you enjoy. I am a consultant for Medtronic. <clears throat> so pelvic arterial hemorrhage is, is uh, something that I find to be quite fascinating. It occurs uh, in the minority of patients that have pelvic fractures. Um, although, you know, traditionally it was said to be 2% of the population, I think we see a lot more uh, pelvic arterial hemorrhage on CTs now. Um, but the mortality with a pelvic uh, bleed is very high if it's from an arterial cause, uh, particularly if patients are hypotensive. And the key is to act fast and get into the hospital, you know, ideally within three hours. The American College of Surgeons turnaround time, uh, incidentally, is now 30 minutes for even for having uh, the availability of embolization. We don't really know what that means, if that means when the team is there, when the resident is there, when the IR attending is there, but you know, we're focused on managing this problem. And one of the, one of the things I really like about this is that it's, an, it's um, the history of IR is rooted in trauma and the history of pelvic embolization is um, really comes from the early 1970s. And it's really what got us, 
got uh, you know embolization as a foothold in just in radiology and then in medicine in general. And um, this is the first article that was published in 1972 by Ernie Ring and some others, including Dr. Waltman from the Waltman Loop fame and Stan Baum. And <clears throat> what they did in 1972, this is when a case report could get into the New England Journal, but they took autologous blood and what they would do is, this is an angiogram of someone with an obturator bleed and you could make uh, blood coagulate in a syringe if you just lay it aside for a few minutes and then you can inject it and if it doesn't clot then you can put some thrombin in it and selectively inject it into an obturator artery or into an internal iliac anterior division for example and you and they found that they could create stasis and you know I found that this was um and here they use two milliliters of this of, uh, of this patient's own blood and this is this is the inspiring case that kind of, you know, led me to kind of dive deeper into gel film and, and temporary embolics, but also trauma in general is really what made me want to become an interventional radiologist. I work at San Francisco General Hospital, and I just really enjoy um, trying to save someone's life and achieve hemostasis in the fastest way possible. It's kind of like speed chess, uh, where regular chess is like tumor embolization, and this is like speed chess. So if we think about gel foam, it's been around for a long time. It is a porcine skin gelatin, which is bubbled with nitrogen and air dried, kind of like a pork rind type situation. You get this sponge. Uh, it's made by several companies. Most commonly in the United States, we get it from Pfizer. It was first used for hemorrhage in 1945. And it was the first embolization that I can find anywhere in the literature for therapeutic purposes with gel foam was in 1964 by a neurosurgeon who used it in a, pushed it through a um, open uh, carotid artery to occlude a CC fistula. Um, the mechanism of action of gel foam is that it acts like an occlusive sponge and it supports thrombus uh, formation. And the beauty of it is that it is temporary in that it dissolves after about 21 days. So it is created from uh, porcine skin and it is um, uh, purified and then you get gelatin and then you get gel foam. And I will note that there is some controversy about, obviously, as there should be about using a porcine product and people that there's a lot of people in, in the world that do not want pork injected into their body for a number of different reasons. And this sort of controversy has not really been resolved in IR. I think we don't think about it when we're doing the embolizations in some random patient with a pelvic fracture, but maybe we should, and maybe we should, you know, better uh, kind of define these substances and let people consent when possible. And um, and there's a precedent there because, you know, porcine valves are, are in, in the heart are used. Gel foam acts like a clotting, uh, like a scaffold, uh, a matrix that facilitates uh, thrombosis, but can, it can also injure platelets and then re, they release uh, thromboplastin and then you can get a thrombus formation. Over time, uh, gel foam is said to you know, dissolve, as I mentioned. It, here is an example of gel foam injected into an artery, and this is an example of Curaspun, which is a uh, form of gel foam, a brand of gel foam. And here you have this you know, immediate reaction where you get this inflammation and medial necrosis. Um, after seven days, initially you get some PMNs, then you get this big old medial necrosis, and then you get this intimal hyperplasia. And that is a uh, probably a chronic process. So we expect the arteries that get hit with gel foam and pelvic embolization and trauma, they're probably not gonna be normal. And it's very rare that someone comes back for a second embolization to actually look. But we've all seen cases where it's gone away or where the artery is damaged. So it's not, it's not really totally clear in human studies. Gel foam is malleable and handling is not standard. You can form a torpedo with it. You can cut it up. It even comes in for the lazy interventional radiologist. It comes in pre-cut uh, cubes and you can make a slurry. I think the, the important thing about a slurry is to know that you can make it very thick or very thin. This is an example of me making a very thick slurry where I've 
I haven't even cut the gel foam. I just shoved that sponge in there, just jam it in there and you hook it up to that three-way stopcock and you just force that baby down there and then you get this, you can get a quick, real thick slurry. So you don't have to cut it up, um, but you just get different particle sizes and you can mess with all these variables. So these are slow-mo uh, videos that we took uh, highly magged uh, in a little mock-up in my office with uh, one of our residents, Dr. Isikbe. And you can see that the torpedo comes out and it really puffs up. And um, here, take a look at this torpedo puffing up there. It absorbs all this uh, kind of solution, in this case, saline. And you get this large chunk, but you still get little chunks along with it. When you go with a thick slurry, you get like a bunch of, you know, it's, it's pretty dramatic. You get a lot of, you get an explosive uh, uh, release of this gel foam out of the end of that catheter. And that's very, um, it's not a finesse move when you inject the gel foam slurry. It's gonna go everywhere. So if you're in a dangerous area and you're worried about reflux, you really wanna avoid gel foam at all. Here's an example of a cut slurry. It looks like it's just a bunch of tor torpedoes coming out. This is an example, again, of that super slow mode of that torpedo. So when it comes out, it puffs up very fast. And that's the beauty of gel foams. It absorbs its weight in blood. And if you, you got to push very hard to get this thing out sometimes and you bend the one-way uh, syringe just getting it out. This is an example of if you don't uh, do this right. Um, here's an example of a patient that had a right internal mammary artery stab wound, extravasation, hemothorax, embolized, you know, big time with coils, you can see all the coils, and then it was topped off with gel foam. And well, that gel foam didn't just sit there in the right internal mammary. And if you, if someone pulled back and did another run and you have a, a dirty catheter at that point, or you can spray that gel foam that you've already, you know, created uh, static slurry in the, re in the rema, you can spray it into the vert. So that's bad, real bad there. Um, when you have stasis, you know, you can, the gel foam is gonna come out. And in this case, it's gonna come out and kind of puff back. So that's when it's really sketchy uh, when you already have stasis that when you get, that's when you get the most reflux. Well, in pelvic fractures, the complications are infrequent, thankfully. And that's where we use most of our gel foam. Uh, we see, you know, the big concern is buttock claudication and buttock necrosis. This occurs, there's case reports of this. Obviously, if you take down the anterior division of the internal iliac, you're going to have uh, impotence. If you, um, you know, if you take down the internal pudendal artery and uh, paresthesias in the perineum and non-target embolization is uh, a concern, although it's usually contained within the anterior division or the posterior division, and we don't really see non-target embolization sequelae. So, as it turns out, the way we handle gel foam affects particle size quite a bit. If we create a torpedo, then we have uh, about the size of a microcatheter, which is about a thousand uh, microns. If we create a thick slurry, like I showed you in that video, then, and we don't over pump it, then we can create something along the 500 to 200 micron range. And this is based on some studies that were done uh, in swine. And if we create a very thin slurry with over pumping it like over 30 pumps, then you get, you get a lot of particles that are below 500 microns. And that is probably important because if we over pump, then we get the small particles. And it turns out that in like uterine artery embolizations and other tumor uh, models and also some anecdotal reports in the trauma literature, it looks like 500 microns is kind of the threshold for particle size. We shouldn't go below that. So we should try to get our particles to be probably in the thick slurry range or at least in cutting and not over pump it. This is an example of me, of, of a case that I did when I was a fellow where I over pushed too much gel foam on this patient on the right. This is a completely different patient that has nothing to do with a case that I did or anything like that. But this is an example of a patient that underwent uterine artery embolization uh, with the uh, uh, sorry, had a postpartum hemorrhage and underwent anterior division, internal iliac gel foam embolization. And you get this, um, this really, you know, non-target embolization with gluteal necrosis. There's no way 
that there was an injury that caused uh, this from the patient. This is all the, the embolics fault. Gluteal necrosis is still a big concern. The surgeons, the orthopedists kind of warn us about this and they don't like it. The, you know, they're worried about non-union with their fractures. I think the key is to really not overdo gel foam, just be unilateral when you can, or be uh, in the anterior posterior division when you can. Other temporary embolics are really not on the market for this. Uh, I think, you know, I put this slide up here to try to inspire you to try to come up with other temporary embolics. The whole, the market is rich and fertile for development of other embolics. Uh, lot, some of them are based on gel foam and you can uh, change the rate of degradation by glutaraldehyde cross-linking. And also hydrogels are being investigated as well. And, you know, endovascular trauma research needs to be done uh, by all of us. And, you know, I take some blame for not doing it as much as I should. The majority of pelvic embolization trauma literature and trauma research in general is done by outside of IR. And I want to inspire all of you to think about trauma. It is a wonderful um, niche in, in interventional radiology. It's fun. People know you're around the hospital and you get to save people's lives. So in conclusion, I will say that gel foam handling is affected by how much we pump it. Um, and we want to not over pump gel foam through that three-way stopcock. We think that seven to 21 days is overkill for the time needed to, you know, cause, uh, you know, uh, cessation of blood uh, extravasation and hemostasis. And this is a ripe area for people to investigate. And the last thing I'll say is that when you get into IR, I realize one of the things that I really enjoy is being in the flow state. And that's when you get into this area during a procedure between anxiety, which is sometimes the way I feel when I'm doing pulmonary vascular malformations, and boredom, which is like when I sometimes feel that when I'm in a pick line. And one of the things that I really love about IR is just being away from the noise and away from the constant communication and just getting into the zone. This is kind of the feeling that I used to get when I was like working on a lathe, for example, turning bowls. And, you know, you get into this zone and this is a very pleasing area. And I realized that this is one of the things I like best about IR. And I think in medicine, for example, you don't, when you're in a busy outpatient clinic, for example, you don't get to be in this flow state. You don't get this this great moment in your career, in your life, when you get to just take a pause, get a good playlist going, and then do a trauma embolization. And that's all I got to say. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Conrad. The next matter I'd like to introduce is Dr. Zaim Billa. He is a current PGY2 resident at Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles. Thanks for the introduction, Lindsay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Zaim. Uh, as Lindsay said, I'm a PGY2 at Kaiser Permanente LAMC. Uh, so today I'll be monitoring the neuro and stroke talk. We have two great presenters here today. Uh, our first presenter is Dr. Sabine Don, who currently works as an interventional radiologist at PIH Health based in Los Angeles, California. His passion for interventional radiology stems from the interplay between his two greatest interests, technology and medicine that drive the field. And then moderating our chat box will be Dr. Venu Badlamudi. He is a board certified diagnostic and interventional radiologist based in Alexandria, Virginia. He is fellowship trained in neurointerventional radiology at the University of Michigan. And he is currently board certified in CNS endovascular surgery, endovascular medicine, IR, DR, and vascular interpretation. And uh, with that being said, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Dand. Can you guys hear me fine? Right yep, now? we can. Okay, cool. So, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I, I really appreciate it. You know, I'm going to be talking about neuro. I'm one of the local uh, IRs out here at LA. Um, and no disclosures. Uh, I work at these three hospitals at, in PIH, you know, Whittier, Downey, and uh, Good Sam in LA. So, definitely, if any of you are local, just come by and stop by anytime. Uh, you know, you mentioned Venu. He's a great guy. This is my team. Uh, he, you know, 
uh, created this edition of seminars in interventional radiology that if any of you are really recommended uh, are interested in neuro, definitely take it take a look at this uh, edition. It was in June and really goes over a lot of topics. Uh, the topics you know go range from everything. I'm going to talk about stroke today, but there are a ton, a ton of neuro topics and are really, really interesting. A lot of them that I didn't even know when I went through all of my training. So uh, definitely recommend this. And, and I'm going to talk to you guys about ischemic strokes. Now, ischemic strokes are um, the majority of strokes. You have ischemic and hemorrhagic, and about uh, almost a million ischemic strokes occur every year. And um, with ischemia, there's a lack of blood flow to the brain, usually because of a clot. And you have time to actually save that part of the brain. And that's why everyone calls it time is brain. You have these collateral pathways that allow you to actually save some brain if you can reestablish that blood flow. And, you know, everyone says time is brain. If you do any neuro rotation or anything, that's you're gonna that's you're probably gonna hear that within the first five minutes of your rotation. So two million brain cells die every minute. And this is what a normal brain looks like. You have your your skull, you have your gray and white matter, you have your ventricles. This is what, you know, I hope my brain looks like right now. Um, but when you have a stroke, this is what it could look like. You have your whole, you have a craniectomy, the, all the swelling in your brain. This is actually an old stroke, believe it or not. And uh, you can see how detrimental that is. And imagine another occlusion on the other side causing another stroke, for example, right here. And this is just not compatible with life. So um, this, there's, there's barely any gray white that's, that's viable. Um, of course, this patient didn't make it, but we have tools and techniques now to prevent this. And, and that's something that's been uh, under development over the past 20 years, but have really, really, really gained um, really some, some notable uh, advancements over the last five to seven years. And so uh, part of that is due to these devices called stent retrievers. The stent retrievers looked like this in the beginning. And UCLA, actually, right over here locally, they developed the Mercy device. And the Mercy device was this little corkscrew that, as you can see in this video, should really kind of grab onto the clot. You deploy this in the brain, into the vessel, to try to grab the clot. All right. And so this was kind of the first revolutionary thought of how to develop these stent retrievers or other devices to actually um, take back or, 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 uh, or, or remove the clot. So <clears throat> the scent retrievers have evolved and become even more, you know, advanced. You know, the Mercy, you saw that corkscrew device, it really kind of just unraveled when you pulled it and uh, it, it didn't really stay that same shape. So people have developed, you have all these different companies and this is a huge area of advancement. Um, then in addition to the actual devices, imaging from the radiology perspective has really, really advanced too. I mean, you get these beautiful, you know, we don't get that much color in radiology, right? And so in, in, in neuro and in perfusion imaging, you get these beautiful color maps. They're, they're awesome. And they actually tell you a lot of information. And the information we're looking for is what kind of brain we can save. In 2015, we had these, you know, a bunch of trials from all around the world that basically proved that stroke intervention for going for these large clots, they proved to be so effective that they're saving lives and saving brain. And, um, you know, since then, we've had multiple trials. You've probably maybe heard of these even Dawn and Diffuse. I mean, it's, they're mentioned in Wall Street Journal and everything because we're able to take out some of these brains that are affected for um, an entire day. We can go in and still attempt to remove the clot. And uh, a lot of this comes down to patient selection. The patient selection and the team that goes into uh, going for these clots is what has proved its effectiveness. And it's really, it's, 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 a, it's a whole system. I mean, this is, again, this is, I got to be a part of Venu's edition of this, um, uh, of this uh, series. And, you know, this is a little art, this is a little diagram. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. It's not just the IR. It's not just the ER. It's a bunch of teams working together to get this clot out. And you get, again, these beautiful images. You see something called penumbra, our core, which is an area of brain that is affected not getting enough blood flow, but the volume or the total amount of blood getting there is maintained. And that's because of those collaterals that are going there. 
And we have a lot of ways to get to the brain. I mean, you've seen a bunch of angiograms now. A lot of you are familiar. Maybe, you know, you're, you're, you've seen some. But you can go from the groin up to the brain. You can go from the wrist up to the brain. You can go from the arm. You can go directly into the carotid artery, too. Uh, we tend to really go, most people go from the groin, like in the red areas. And a lot of us have been adopting um, upper radial or radial access for these cases. And we have a ton of different catheters. These catheters we don't use that much in the peripheral side, but they're very, very common um, when you're when you're engaging the arch, especially from below. And and this is what an angiogram of the brain looks like. You have your AP and lateral, and it tends to be you know there's a lot of information here. I mean it's your brain, and all those vessels there are going to an, you know I call L all cortex eloquent, and and meaning that that every every single vessel there is important. And so when you're looking for a clot. You're looking for anything both on both uh, films. And I'm going to show you a couple cases just to kind of show you how that looks like. Like, So if you remember, this was how the AP or the front view looks like. Here's the middle cerebral artery, which goes to the left side of the brain. And hey, Sabine, in this um, yeah. uh, venue here, hey, if you can go back to that last slide, I just wanted to point out something to the yeah. uh, viewers, the attendees. Uh, when you look on that AP uh, angiogram and you look at the course of the anterior cerebral artery, I just sort of caught my eye that, and I didn't know in this particular case if the patient had some sort of a mass or something uh, sitting in the in the sort of medial mm -hmm. part of the lobe. Yeah, so just uh, caught my eye, or I don't know if you were going to point that out. Yeah, you know, I was uh, I, I wasn't going to, but you know, Vayne is too smart that he can see all this. That's right. Actually, this patient had pretty severe hydrocephalus or, or moderate, and this was was pushing um, uh, a little bit. There wasn't a mass there though, but. Um, that was the cause of, of this course. This course of the anterior cerebral artery should go straight up as Venu is pointing. And it does look straight on the lateral view, but you can see when you look on the AP view, you can see the abnormal contour. And uh, that, was, um, that was a good pickup, Venu. <laughs> um, so in this, in this uh, angiogram, you can see that you're missing this main vessel here. And this is the middle cerebral artery. And in most patients on the left side, the left middle cerebral artery is the dominant because they're right-handed. So most patients are right-handed. So this is a dominant side of the brain that is being affected. And there are a lot of techniques we have out there to go after that clot. And these techniques can be as simple as deploying a stent all right, into the clot, as you can see here. You take that stent and then you pull it down into what's called a balloon guide catheter. And this is kind of what, what, what people were doing um, once we developed these uh, stent retrievers and balloon guide catheters, and it was working really well. You know, then you have people who have developed aspiration catheters where you literally forget the stent, just go up there and vacuum that clot out. And you can see in these diagrams, obviously, it looks like it works perfectly, and a lot of times it does but sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of people have been developing more techniques. This technique, which is using a balloon guide catheter, an intermediate catheter, using everything. You're using a bunch, you're throwing the whole kitchen sink, stent retriever, aspiration are these, these, these arrows, this balloon. Uh, this is a, 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 a kind of technique that I use pretty much for all my, my strokes if I can. And, um, no, uh, it's it's a great name too, and and maybe that's why I use it. It's called the badass technique. So, so that's that's the technique that I like to use, and and one of the best things about neuro, and and if you go into neuros, they love their names. So here are just a small list of techniques for stroke specifically, and trap, adapt, save, fast. Of course, badass is the one that I I, I like to use. Um, now just to kind of give you an overall picture. Uh, and just to show you what kind of a case looks like, you have this 64-year-old gentleman who presented, you know, uh, with over 12 hours of, of, uh, of um, symptoms. And we call that a wake-up stroke because the last time he was known well or the last time that someone could document that he was doing okay was before he went to sleep. So he woke up and he woke up with dense left hemiparesis, aphasic. And this guy is having a large stroke. And remember I showed you that normal CT? Well, the brain is normal here. Uh, are almost normal, but uh, there is a dense clot. You can see here, you you ex you shouldn't see a vessel here because it's a non-contrast and you see a dense clot. And on these beautiful perfusion maps, I mean, no one can miss that there is something wrong there, right? But over here, this looks normal. And so that's something that we call penumbra. Our core 
our brain that we can save. And so here again is that clot. The other image I showed you was on the other side. This is on the right. And not to say that the non-dominant side is, is um, not important. They're just as important. And so, um, well, we get through the clot using those, those different techniques that are saying microcatheters, micro wires, things that you've seen this morning. And through that, we're able to basically deploy this stent. And this is what it looks like in real time. Here's a stent that's being deployed through a microcatheter. Okay, this is one of our older cases here. And this is a stent that's being deployed across that clot in the brain. And once that stent is cut, this is a different technique where you just pull the stent retriever into this other catheter, okay? And you're literally just pulling that. You can, you can see it, it, there's a little bit of tension, not even a little bit, a lot of times you're pulling pretty hard and you pull that into the catheter while you're creating suction. Now this is an old case, so this is old catheters. Look, at, after just doing it one time, or we call it one pass, we're able to reestablish the blood flow into that area. So again, this was completely blocked, and in an instant, after a couple minutes, we're able to reestablish blood flow. If you don't believe me, this was the brain that would have infarcted, and everything that's white on this uh, MRI is what infarcted. And yes, there are infarcts here. This is not this guy did not come out with a zero stroke, but to be honest, he had barely any symptoms. If not, you would never even know this guy had a stroke. Uh, the, his stroke is involving the right basal ganglia, and guess what? You have two, so you're okay. Um, I know that's an oversimplified version, but uh, Venu, I hope you agree. So these are what the clots look like. I mean, this is literally, these are different clots. They're tiny, but they're deadly, all right? And these are what we get off. These are stent retrievers. These are just some of the clots that we take. And so time is actually brain. And we're, we're really going, the devices are developing to get these clots out. I'm going to show you one case and then see if I have time for a second case. If not, that's okay. Some of you may have seen this case that I've presented at, at CCIR. But on here, remember, we talked about a, a dense clot. And this is a 35-year-old guy. He was a knee replacement. He was status post knee replacement, 35 years old. This guy's younger than me. And he lost consciousness while doing physical therapy on, on day two after his knee operation. All right. And the basilar artery and vertebral artery here on the left it is dense, okay? You should not see, that's what normal vessel looks like, and this is what a dense vessel looks like, all right? That is not good. Posterior strokes kill, all right? That, that is your, so applying your brainstem, if, and, and if you wanna see, there is his entire cerebellum, his, his entire brainstem is being affected, all right? And he's not getting blood flow. This guy is, is a goner if we can't do anything. And if you see an injection of, of the vertebral artery here, there is no blood flow going up to the brain. That's a left vertebral artery injection, AP and lateral, nothing on his layering because there's nothing going up. So again, we get through the clot. He has nice juicy vessels. He's 35 years old. We take out the clot as a unit. Okay, this is as a unit here. We're not pulling it into that catheter. We're pulling it into a base catheter that you might be able to see in the, in the edge of the film. But we're pulling this because the clot might, is so big. And literally, the devices work so well that your clots can be this big, all right? So this came out of this guy's basilar vert as a piece. You can even see the femoral valves. I mean, this is obviously, this is a PFO. This big clot post-op ortho surgery went straight up through his heart into his brain. And uh, fortunately enough, we have blood flow reestablished to the posterior brain. Find, uh, you know, you might not care about the cerebellum as much, but... The brain stem is, is the key, you know? So that is perfused. And guess what? This is what he came out with. So this guy was lucky. Uh, he was in the hospital. We brought him down instantly and, 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 and were able to treat him. So in the, in the purposes of time, I, I, I don't know, um, are, we, are we past our 10 minutes? I can show a second case or we can go to Q&A. I think we are just about at our 1035 endpoint. Yeah, that's um, fine. That's fine. If, uh, um, if people want to do q and I can answer any questions. Or Vayne, you can. Yeah, yeah, I think that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I think I've been yeah trying to keep up on uh, the, the questions. A lot of good you know questions and comments in the uh, uh, chat over here. You know, people are asking about uh, some of the different um, you know selection parameters. For example, with CT perfusion imaging. 
uh, which is, uh, you know, can be complicated, but, but broadly speaking, you're looking for uh, the, a small, ideally a small area of what we estimate to be the core infarct, uh, which is typically seen on the cerebral blood volume or cerebral blood flow maps and uh, a large area of salvageable tissue or what we had considered as ischemic penumbra on the uh, time to peak or uh, T max or time max uh, map. So um, those are, you know, a couple of the parameters from perfusion. Yeah, fact, I know, why, yeah, why don't we do this you know, um, nice. in the interest of time, just because we want to keep it moving. Uh, sure. If Venu and Sabine can uh, kind of go to the chat to maybe answer some of the questions. I know Venu has been doing a good job. Sabine, if you don't mind going and looking at some yeah, of those questions. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll just Absolutely. continue on forward. But thanks a lot. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Always. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Appreciate thanks it. Miss everyone. Yeah, agreed. Thanks again, Dr. Don. That was an excellent presentation. What a case at the end. <laughs> um, and thank you, Dr. Vada Moody, for answering all those questions in the chat box. Uh, so next, I'll transition to our next moderator. This is uh, Jay Jung. He's a medical student at Georgetown University. And he'll be monitoring, uh, moderating the gastrointestinal genital urinary section. I also wanted to add a quick plug. We do have a QR code for filling out a survey for all of our attendees. Uh, Navjeet can show the uh, QR code while Jay introduces the next speaker, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Zain, for introducing me. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Karidi as our next presenter. Um, Dr. Karidi is a Division Director of Interventional Radiology at University of Alabama at Birmingham and is an active member of SIR serving as vice chair of the SIR Foundation Board of Directors. She is passionate about women's health and we are excited to hear Dr. Karidi's talk on women's health in the IR. So without further ado, Dr. Karidi. Thank you so much. I'm just getting my uh, presentation up here. All right. Well, thank you so much for the um, warm introduction. It's good to see familiar faces and also new faces. I wish, um, as I'm sure everybody does, that we were in person. But hopefully we can talk a little bit about women's health and interventional radiology today and why I am so excited about this topic. These are my disclosures. So specifically, I'd like to explore the role of uterine artery embolization and why it's used in multiple disease processes. Um, and I think this will uh, be a good example of why I'm so excited about this particular procedure for women. Also review pelvic venous disorders and the role for IR treatment, particularly in pelvic congestion syndrome, and then also touch on the fertility intervention in IR. So we'll start with UAE. Um, uterine artery embolization is a uterine sparing opportunity for women with multiple disease processes in the gynecologic space. Uh, and often saves a woman from having a hysterectomy prematurely. Some of the spaces in which uh, uterine artery embolization is used is for symptomatic fibroids, symptomatic adenomyosis. It can be used preoperatively and then also for postpartum hemorrhage. So we'll start with fibroids, which are also known as lyomyoma. They're the most common pelvic tumor in women. Um, it affects a huge part of the female population. So 70% of Caucasian and 80% of African-American women are affected by the age of 50. Only about half of those are symptomatic and um, even less seek treatment. Fibroids are actually the most common indication still for hysterectomy in the United States. And sometimes, like I mentioned before, it's done prematurely. So when we think about treating fibroids, we have to really think about what, uh, where they are located within the uterus. And they can be in various locations that include the submucosal space, the, sub the intramural space, and also subserosal. The reason why this is important is because it gives us some idea if the fibroids are actually causing the woman's symptoms. So we have to think about this and um, explore it in a very clinical manner. And then also whether uh, uterine artery embolization is the right treatment for the patient or not. Um, we don't just get a consult and say, yep, we're gonna do it. We, we really look into the clinical aspects of this and whether it's an appropriate procedure for a woman. When we do move on to uterine artery embolization, when a woman's the right candidate, we think about uh, potential access sites. And one of those is the femoral artery. And you heard um, several people already talk about that you can also use the radial artery in the wrist for a lot of interventional radiology procedures. And this is one of them. Once we go beyond and we get to the iliac arteries, the procedure is all essentially the same from there. So we then navigate into the hypogastric artery or in the internal iliac artery is another name for it. And then we select the anterior division of the internal iliac artery and ultimately the uterine artery. 
the uterine artery, and I'll go back just so you can see, it has this very characteristic hypertrophied um, and torturous shape and also is known to be U in shape. Once we decide we're gonna treat and we've selected, we treat with a particulate embolic, uh, sometimes they're referred to as beads here in the picture, it shows PVA. You can also hear microspheres. In any case, these are on the micron level. They're like grains of sand that essentially block the blood flow to the fibroids. And the reason why we utilize these is when we think about a tumor of which a fibroid is, it's just a benign tumor. We really wanna to get to the tumoral level, to the capillary level. And so we're thinking about something really small like these particles. We use our imaging to help guide us. Pre-procedure on the left side of your screen, you'll see the, uh, the uterus in sagittal plane. And so that's a contrast enhanced study where you can see a large fibroid uh, filling the uterus. Then the middle picture is when we're actually performing the procedure at angiography. I used an example where we had bilateral access. So this is not my case, but I wanted you to see that you can, it nicely stains when you get into both uterine arteries and deliver contrast, it nicely stains the whole fibroid and uterus. And then finally, on the right side of the screen, this is the uh, fibroid after it's been embolized. So you can see that that white part of the uterus is still enhancing. So the normal tissue still enhances, but the fibroid itself is dead. Fibroids, there's a smaller one uh, down inferiorly. And that you also have volume reduction of the fibroid in comparison to the pre-procedure images. We'll transition and talk about adenomyosis, which is a little bit of a different entity. And what it is, is actually the transgression of endometrial tissue into the musculature of the uterus. It's similar in, in the timing as uterine fibroids, and it's clinically present typically in women age 40 to 50. It also presents with abnormal uterine bleeding and dysmenorrhea. Pain tends to be a bigger component of uh, adenomyosis than it is with fibroids. And it overlaps with other gynecologic disorders, not only in the fact that it can be present with other disorders like fibroids, but also has similar symptomatology and often can be confused with other things like endometriosis as well. This is a graphic of sort of what adenomyosis is. So on the left side of the screen, you see a normal uterine musculature. On the right, you can see that it's filled with cystic spaces and that's what adenomyosis does. If you look at it on our imaging, similar to what we looked at previously, except this one, we have a fluid sensitive sequence on the left, the middle is our post contrast, and then the right is actually an MRI. So looking specifically within the MRI images at the vessels themselves. I'll draw your attention to the, the left and the middle image, and the, you see those small holes in the middle image, it's those dark spots, those are those cystic spaces. The other thing you see on um, with adenomyosis is just distension of what we call the ju junctional zone. So that whole area you can see is very abnormal. Once we embolize the uh, uterine arteries for adenomyosis, this is that same patient with a much smaller uterus. So a lot of volume reduction and all that adenomyotic tissue is uh, no longer enhancing on that right sided image. That small white rind of tissue is the only part of the normal uterine tissue uh, that was present in this woman. The rest of her uterus was distended from adenomyosis. We'll talk a little bit now about preoperative UAE and why it's so useful. So there are several women um, who have extremely large fibroid uh, burden like this patient. So you kind of see here where I just um, highlighted, this is that the smaller part of the fibroid uterus. This is one large fibroid mass. And you can see on these axial images of the MRI uh, that this mass actually extends all the way up to the liver and the kidneys and was pressing on the mesenteric vessels. And so this was an important case because some women not only just have, are going to have tremendous blood loss because of the uh, degree of their fibroid burden, but some don't accept blood products. And in this particular patient was a Jehovah's Witness and was going to surgery, but wouldn't accept blood products. And so it was important to embolize her before the procedure. This is at explant. You could see that on the left side of the screen, that smaller part of her fibroid uterus, and then the large um, fibroid mass that was emanating from the fundus of her uterus. This patient actually only had about 50 cc's of blood loss at surgery. We also intervene with postpartum hemorrhage, there's sort of two flavors of postpartum hemorrhage. There's early or primary, and then there's delayed or secondary. The early and primary typically is due to uterine atony. Delayed or secondary is often caused by retained products of conception or uter uterine arteriovenous malformations. That's a wordful and a mouthful. And so what, what I'm showing you here is a case of a primary postpartum hemorrhage. And this patient um, had lost about five liters of blood before we were able to intervene. Uh, they had tried a lot of um, um, other techniques, including a Bakri balloon, which just kind of puts pressure on the uterus from the um, endometrial canal. 
So this patient, I'll give you uh, some arrows here. This is the small uterine artery. So uh, this is a woman who's in profound shock. Um, and that, that's evidenced by this teeny tiny uterine artery, which would be gigantic in a woman around birth if uh, she wasn't had not received, had so much blood loss. And this kind of bleed is a gusher. This is an enormous bleed. You can see on the right sided image, this is after embolization. This is an aortogram where we follow it into the pelvis. You can see, you don't, you don't see any of this extravasation anymore, but what's also nice is that the vessels are starting to plump up in comparison to what they were before. We're gonna transition and talk about pelvic venous disorders. So this is a spectrum of disorders that results in chronic pelvic pain. It can come along with a lot of other things, including lower extremity and vulvar varicosities, lower extremity swelling and pain, and also left flank pain and hematuria are other signs and symptoms. Um, pelvic congestion syndrome is a, kind of an older term, but it's it, the easiest way to describe it is what most people know. Um, it falls underneath this umbrella and also, and others do as well, and we'll talk about those briefly. This is just a graphic of what happens in pelvic congestion syndrome, and essentially you get a, a large gonadal or ovarian vein, you can see that on the left side here, and when blood flow is supposed to go in the direction of the heart, it actually goes down into the pelvis. When we typically think of pelvic congestion syndrome, the most common cause we think about is these leaky valves or inadequate valves venous causing venous insufficiency. And this is what it looks like on our pre-procedure imaging at times. So you have this large gonadal vein on CT, and then sometimes we have these periuterine vessels um, that are also enlarged and that we can look at with flow. And so we talked about this very first cause, which is venous insufficiency from valve dysfunction, and that blood flow goes in the wrong direction with that. But what about if a vein um, is narrowed upstream? And so in this case, the renal vein and nutcracker syndrome may be narrowed. And what's gonna happen from that is the same thing. A woman can develop uh, pelvic congestion-like symptoms because of blood flow going in the wrong direction. Similarly, um, the iliac vein can be compressed like in May Thurner syndrome. And a woman can experience internal iliac um, reflux and result in pelvic congestion symptoms. So, it's important to know all these things because the treatment would be different potentially based on the etiology of the pelvic congestion symptoms. For pure venous insufficiency, we do what's called embolization. That's what's shown in the image here. And we'll show an actual picture of us doing that in just a moment. When a patient has a narrowing of a vein, we think about stenting it open with a tube-like structure that kind of opens up that narrowing. Um, but in some patients who are young or who may be more appropriate for um, a long, for longevity reasons may require surgery. And in the case of nutcracker, that's called renal vein transposition. In May Thurner, we may consider stenting or in women who have not experienced uh, clot related to their venous narrowing and have mild symptoms, we may consider observing just given the longevity of stents is not fantastic at this point. Here's uh, the same graphic of this, uh, what we call sort of a sandwich technique of coils and sclerosing foam in this picture, but um, it may be a host of different embolic agents that we close the vein with. This is a case where we come up from the femoral vein in the groin region, we come over into the left renal vein, we've injected the gonadal vein, and we see that the blood flow goes in the wrong direction and fills all those vessels in the deep pelvis rather than going back towards the heart. This is post embolization and we've done a combination of a sclerosin and coils. What I like about sclerosin is you can see it's affected this coil pack down here. See how this coil pack is more narrow? That's because as the sclerosin works within the vein, it actually causes damages to it actually causes damage to the vein and you get some uh, effects as you as you continue to, to embolize. We're just going to very briefly touch on fertility intervention and IR as we wrap up here. For infertility is, a, is also a major problem for our uh, female and male population, um, but for different reasons. So 10% of women of reproductive age experience infertility. Uh, a lot of these cases, about a third of them are due to fallopian tube obstruction. Often this is due to an obstruction in the proximal tube and it's the most likely re uh, region given its anatomy and tortuosity. Fallopian tube recanalization is a, is a wonderful procedure that often gets overlooked. It's minimally invasive. It's very cost effective. It allows a woman to actually conceive naturally and without hormonal intervention. And actually, when you look at the data, it has similar outcomes to IVF if the cause of the uh, infertility is fallopian tube obstruction. This image is very hard to look at because it's so up close, but essentially what this is, is that uh, contrast filling the endometrial canal of the uterus we do what's called a diagnostic study. It's a hysterosalpingogram. That's just the part where we diagnose the problem. So we, we put a balloon catheter 
into the endometrial canal through the cervix that allows us to inject the contrast and make it stay. So we can fill out the whole uterine cavity and then also try to see spillage of the fallopian tubes um, to see if they're obstructed or not. In this case, there's obstruction for this patient. It's the left of the screen, but the right side of their uterus. And so um, this patient can be taken on to recanalization. Recanalization is done similar to a lot of other IR techniques with a catheter and a wire, most typically. And in this case, uh, afterwards, the repeat hysterosalpingogram where you inject uh, the uterus again with contrast, the endometrial canal, you can see that there's spillage of that contrast appropriately and the tube is no longer obstructed. So a simple fix for a very difficult problem. In summary, um, I want you to remember that UAE is a uterine sparing consideration for the treatment of multiple gynecologic disorders as we demonstrated. Um, there's several etiologies for pelvic congestion type symptoms. So not just venous insufficiency and valve dysfunction, but also venous compression syndrome. So we have to be aware of those when we're evaluating a woman um, with these symptoms. And then finally, that fallopian tube rehanalization is an effective treatment for infertility and allows a woman to conceive naturally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Curry, for this insightful talk. Um, in, in the interest of time, I would like to move on to, and introduce the next moderator, Hero Sparks, a uh, medical student at UCLA, and he'll be introducing our next speaker. Hey, everyone. It's, a, it's an honor to introduce our next two panelists. Um, uh, first is Dr. Jeff McWilliams. He's a vascular interventional radiologist here at the University of California, Los Angeles Medical Center. Uh, he's the interim division chief and previously interventional radiology fellowship and residency program director. Um, sorry. He, uh, he is one of our world's leading experts on prostate artery embolization, having uh, written um, multiple guideline statements, including uh, the multi society consensus statement on PAE for lower urinary tract symptoms in 2019, also co authoring an earlier SIR position statement in 2014. Um, Dr. Timothy McClure is also available on, and online and will be responding to questions in the chat. Um, Dr. McClure is amongst the world's also leading experts in gender urinary, urinary IR. Um, he has a unique training background that involves being double boarded in both urology and BIR. He is full time faculty and a member of the Brady Urology at Weill Cornell. Um, where he provides expertise in both urology and radiology. Um, he graduated with a medical degree from the University of Washington, Seattle, and completed both radiology residency and BIR fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, following this training, he also completed urology residency at the Ohio State University, as well as focused ultrasound surgery foundation fellowship at UCLA. Um, Dr. McWilliams, I will turn it over to you now. Thanks a lot, Hero, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's gonna be a quick whirlwind tour of PAE, which is one of my favorite topics. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, the prostate, as you guys know, uh, walnut-sized gland, it's only about 25 cc's in a normal man. It, uh, its function is that it produces part of the fluid component of the semen. And importantly to us, it's situated underneath the bladder where it helps control the flow of urine. Uh, it's become a bigger and bigger problem as time goes on. The aging of our population and the aging of our male population specifically is getting larger and larger and uh, prostatism is something that uh, affects people of uh, older age more and more. And that proportion is extremely high. If you look at it, uh, about a quarter of men over 70 have moderate to severe BPH symptoms that impair their quality of life. So we're talking about millions and millions of men. And some of those men do get things like TERP or prostatectomy, but many of them are afraid of those treatments, uh, sometimes for good reason. And so many men remain untreated or undertreated. And the way that we evaluate patients in the clinic uh, is the same way the urologists do. We have a look at something called the International Prostate Symptom Score, IPSS. And this takes into account seven of the most common symptoms, the irritative and obstructive symptoms that are related to enlarged prostate, as well as how many times they wake up at night, urinate, and they get a total score from zero to 35. And then they also take this quality of life score, which is essentially if they had to spend the rest of their life with their urinary condition the way it is, how would they feel about that? And most patients that are coming to us are usually in the severe range uh, over, over 18 to 20 and have a pretty low quality of life. So this is how it's, uh, how it's ranked, mild, moderate, and severe. And uh, traditional treatments that are usually the first line, often they've had this already by the time they get to us. Usually urologists will start them with medical therapy, which consists of selective alpha blockers, 
or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. But the IPSS improvement, remember it's a 35 point scale, is really quite modest, only three to five points. And so this works well for mild prostate symptoms, but as they become more severe, it just doesn't do the trick. And so traditionally, uh, most patients would then turn to surgical therapy and that would be TERP uh, for prostates up to 80 to 100 cc's in size and then open prostatectomy or robotic prostatectomy for larger prostates. But these are pretty invasive procedures and there can be bleeding, there can be urinary incontinence, erectile problems. Most patients have retrograde ejaculation. You can have urethral stricture. Uh, and these are pretty scary complications that are not uh, particularly rare. And so for those reasons, a lot of men choose to avoid surgical treatment altogether. And so that really left an opening for a minimally invasive treatment to come in and uh, really help. And that is where PAE steps in. So the prostate is a hypervascular organ, kind of like what Teresa was showing with the uh, fibroid uterus. Uh, the adenomas of the prostate are really quite hypervascular. There's a prostatic artery, usually one on each side supplying the blood supply. And if you can super select and embolize the prostate, you can get this partial ischemic necrosis and cause shrinkage of the gland by 30 to 50% and the symptoms uh, improve. So it's pretty analogous to other embolization procedures we do. It's just, we weren't doing this before about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, mostly because the prostatic artery is so small, we really didn't have good microcatheters, uh, but that has changed over the years to where it's really technically possible. And this is what it looks like during a procedure. This is an ipsilateral oblique projection. You can go in femoral or radial. I'm doing about half and half nowadays. And we look for the artery that's coursing toward the midline and you can see this hypervascular blush. This is the prostatic artery here, often has a tortuous course and a variable origin. We use our microcatheter and super select into that vessel. And here you can see, again, this hypervascular blush of this uh, markedly enlarged prostate. We try to get out of ways as close as we can to the prostate and then embolize with small beads. Uh, we confirm our view. This is now an AP or anterior view. You can see this hemispheric filling of the left side of the prostate bulging up into the bladder. There's the median lobe bulging upward. And uh, we know we're in a good place to embolize here. So we go ahead and start injecting beads. Uh, we usually use beads a little smaller than those used in fibroids, about 100 to 500 micron. I usually use 300 to 500 micron size range until you get complete stasis. And the goal is to abolish as much of the flow to the prostate gland as you can. And you carry on to the other side and embolize the other side. So why do we do this? Well, there's a lot of advantages of PAE over the existing therapies. One is there's no limit on prostate size. In fact, the bigger, the better. I've treated up to 600 gram prostates with PAE and it works very well. Uh, it's outpatient. Patients don't have to spend the night. They're in and out in a few hours. The whole thing is done under a conscious sedation. It's not a painful procedure. In fact, you could do it under local anesthesia alone. They hardly feel it. Uh, recovery is quite rapid. The first few days, they will have irritation of the prostate, so they'll have frequent urination, might have a little blood in the urine, may have dysuria, uh, frequent, frequent urination, but uh, those things improve over the first week. And the morbidity in comparison to surgery is much, much lower. So we don't deal with impotence. Incontinence is not an issue. I don't even place a Foley catheter in these patients. Blood loss is minimal, and generally sexual function is unaffected. So uh, there's been a big push for this procedure over the last few years since the, we've had an on-label indication with the FDA that was issued in 2017. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into the data, but just wanted to show just a couple of the studies. Uh, this was one of the randomized controlled trials. There's now five randomized controlled trials supporting the use of PAE. Uh, this one came out of Switzerland. It was quite a high quality randomized controlled trial. It took about 100 patients with moderate to severe urinary symptoms but the prostate volumes were relatively on the small side because these patients had to qualify for both TERP and PAE. So I like even bigger prostates than this, but the, the average volume here was about 50 ml. And they got randomized and then they saw what the IPSS change was. And the ultimate answer was that the change in symptoms really was about the same. It was around 10 points for both PAE and TERP. Uh, we could certainly achieve better than that, I think, in larger prostates, but uh, it is what it is. They had about 10 point IPSS improvement. And the quality of life improvement was pretty similar as well. This is on that six point scale and you're losing two to three points or improving the quality of life by, uh, by several notches on that scale. Erectile function was unaffected. Oh, interestingly, and this is what I've seen in practice as well, this doesn't totally supplant all urologic surgical techniques. I wish it did, but it doesn't. If you have severe objective measures of obstruction, like very low peak flow, or very high post void residuals, you're going to get a better overall result with TERP than you will with PAE. And that's why I've seen in practice as well. So if you have a patient that's fully obstructed, having hydronephrosis from, uh, from such bad urinary obstruction, that's a patient that I would generally try to direct to surgery when possible. Uh, and PAE would be more of a second line therapy. Whereas if they're more symptomatic, 
uh, and don't have those objective signs of obstruction as badly, then PAE can be a great option. Uh, but the advantages of PAE in this randomized control trial, less bleeding, less or no indwelling Foley time, shorter hospital stay by several days and much fewer adverse events, particularly fewer serious adverse events. So the conclusions of that study was that subjective improvement was pretty similar. And since this really is a quality of life issue, this is not a cancer, this is a benign disease, that's really what's most important is how patients feel after the procedure. But keep in mind those objective measures may improve more with TERP, safety profile obviously better with PAE. There's also been a sham controlled study. Urologists love sham controlled studies, so they asked us to do one. And one was done in Portugal. Uh, randomizing 80 men to PAE or a sham procedure. And this is just to make sure there isn't a placebo effect in the PAE, which uh, placebo effects a very real thing in procedural medicine. But at six months, the PAE had a much better IPSS improvement than the sham procedure by about 13 points. Uh, the PAE also had better QOL improvement and the adverse events, interestingly, really weren't much more with PAE than with the sham that goes to show how safe it is. So uh, we used a lot of these studies as the basis of a recent consensus statement that basically had the final conclusion that this is an acceptable minimally invasive treatment option for appropriately selected men with BPH and moderate to severe symptoms. That said, the AUA, which is the Urological Association, still considers PAE experimental. Uh, there are numerous reasons for that. Some of them may be political, but we're pushing for a uh, inclusion of PAE into the next AUA guidelines as a non-experimental therapy. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But for now, uh, you won't always see a lot of urologists uh, championing this procedure. And so we have to take it upon ourselves. And fortunately, our patients often find out on, on their own and kind of self-refer. Wanted to show an example case. This was uh, one from uh, a couple of years ago. It was a 74-year-old, otherwise healthy male. Uh, you can see he has an indwelling Foley catheter and quite a big prostate, about 150 grams. His uh, IPSS prior to the Foley was about 16. So he had fairly moderate to severe symptoms, has quite a low quality of life uh, and this large median lobe bulging into the bladder. So this patient would, uh, really not be a great TERP candidate because of his prostate size. He'd probably have to have an open prostatectomy. He was not at all interested in that. He'd already failed medical therapy and self-referred for uh, PAE. And he's a great candidate. We actually like patients that have Foley catheters. We have about 80% uh, success rate in getting the Foley out and uh, achieving spontaneous urination again. And, uh, and the purpose of time, I'll skip over his interview from before the procedure, but basically he was miserable, uh, was the upshot. And so he chose to go for the PAE. And this was just some images from the procedure. You can see us taking our microcatheter into the prostate on each side. It's very big. You can see these small tortuous vessels filling out the gland of the prostate. And we went ahead and embolized with beads. Two weeks later, we were able to get the Foley out. Usually it comes out two to four weeks afterward. You have to give the prostate a little time to shrink. And at six months, he is peeing like a young man again. IPSS, almost normal. Quality of life was terrific. His prostate had shrunk by over 30%, including the median lobe. And here's some pictures of the prostate from after the procedure. Uh, he then had a 12-month follow-up with an IPSS of one, and that's actually unchanged two years after that. So now he's at three years afterward, and uh, I did another little interview with him, and he basically said that... Uh, he had a terrific, terrific result and I was very, very happy with it. Obviously not having a Foley catheter is a huge improvement in quality of life. So I, I really hope you guys take this up as you're developing your practice. I, I have done a lot of these now. It's one of the most rewarding procedures that I do because men come to you absolutely miserable with really no options in their mind because they're not interested in having these surgeries that can affect their sexual function or urinary function like uh, with incontinence. And so they'll come to you. I, really desperate and you can offer them something that's minimally invasive, has very little risk and has a very high uh, likelihood of a great outcome. Uh, we usually quote about 75 to 80% clinical success rate with the procedure. There are some patients that don't respond uh, and don't get enough prostate shrinkage. So it's not a perfect therapy, but overall we've had great results. And so we think it's gonna fill in in the end this, this gap that exists between medical therapy and surgical therapy, but can also be a completely definitive option in patients who are poor surgical candidates, have uh, very large prostates and patients also who have refractory hematuria and bleeding. And so uh, this is very effective for those patients as well. So moving forward, uh, I've actually managed to partner with a lot of urologists as they've sort of uh, seen their patients having PAE and seen their, the success that they've had. Some of the more open-minded urologists have actually started referring me patients, especially those ones who they don't want to operate on, uh, but ultimately will also have to work in getting the word out to our patients so that they know about this therapy because right now the majority of men suffering from this do not know about PAE. So it's something that hopefully we as a society can change. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. McWilliams, and thank you, Dr. McClure, for answering uh, the questions in the chat. Um, I'd like to introduce next uh, Helena Rockwell, a medical student at UCSD, who will moderate the next section. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so we're going to move things right along. So thank you all for joining us today. Again, my name is Helena. I'm a medical student at UCSD, and I'll be the host and moderator for this session. So this is our first panel session. So it'll be more of a Q&A, a live Q&A right in front of your eyes. Um, we have a very incredible list of very highly accomplished IRs joining us for the Women in IR panel. And believe me when I say that we are beyond lucky to get to meet and hear from each of them today. Um, their full bios are available to you as part of the program, but I will give some brief introductions before we get started. Um, in the interest of time, I don't think that we will wind up having time for audience questions. Um, we have a 30 minute segment, but if we do wind up having time at the end of the preformed questions that I have, then we will open it up to you, the audience, and we will be moderating or monitoring the uh, a Q and A in the chat for any questions that might come in. So, with that, we'll get started. So, Dr. Newton is an IR physician scientist at the San Diego VA Healthcare System and at UCSD. At the VA, she is chief of IR and the wellness director of radiology. She was previously a program director for both the clinician scientist radiology research program and the interventional radiology residency program at UCSD. Um, and she's also an active member of the Radiology Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, um, among other things. Dr. Lahar is an assistant professor in interventional and pediatric radiology at UCLA, um, where she is also the acting associate program director for the integrated and independent interventional radiology residency programs. Dr. Vu is an, inter is an associate professor of radiology, um, also the division chief of vascular and Interventional Radiology and the Integrated Interventional Radiology Program Director at UC Davis. Dr. Koti is an Assistant Professor at the Daughter Interventional Institute at Oregon Health and Sciences University. So you all have heard a lot about Daughter so far today. Um, so that's kind of where a lot of this all started. Um, she currently also serves on multiple SIR committees. She is actively promoting the visibility of women in IR and is an active clinical researcher as well. And then Dr. Hamilton, their last panelist for today. Um, she is the Chief of Interventional Radiology and Vice Chair of Radiology at Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs. She was previously Chair of the Women in IR section of SIR, and she currently serves as the Deputy Editor of IR Quarterly. Um, she also writes about her journey in a male-dominated field in her blog, which is titled the TiredSuperHeroine.com, so I encourage you all to check that out. And so now we'll move into the questions. So for the first few questions, I would like to have all of the panelists answer, um, and then we'll kind of gauge the time. And then for the remaining few questions, we might just have two or three of them answer, depending on the timing. So the first one um, from each of our panelists, I would like to know, how did you discover IR and what other specialties did you consider along the way? And so here is a proposed order that we can follow with that. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lena. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. You guys um, have had some excellent speakers, uh, so this is really a special thing. And I just want to acknowledge all of you who have put in so much work to um, create this program. Um, if you guys don't make it in medicine, which I know you will, you could do um, <laughs> you could just sponsor programs across the U.S. because you've done a, an amazing job. Um, I had kind of a very typical. Um, introduction to IR, which means that I didn't really know that it existed. And um, I remember vaguely seeing um, an angiogram when I was a medical student and thinking, wow, that's beautiful and incredibly complicated. And there's no way I would ever understand that. And so um, I uh, ended up in radiology after potentially doing um, dermatology as a way to kind of maybe do surgery um, as a Mohs surgeon. And then I realized, you know, that's going to just not be what I want to do. So I went to radiology thinking I was going to be a neuroradiologist because I have a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, but as I, um, during my first year of um, clinical radiology, I had a rotation in IR and I was hooked. Um, it was absolutely intoxicating. And so um, I actually spent the next few years trying to convince myself that I wasn't going to do it. And I went into um, Ann Roberts' office um, about six months pregnant and asked her to please talk me out of it. And here I am today. So 
but surgery was a big consideration. Um, I loved plastic surgery because of its creativity and IR seemed to have it all, the diagnostic aspect, the hands-on, um, the resourcefulness. And so that's why I chose a field that I've never regretted one day choosing. I think I absolutely have to echo how typical Dr. Newton's experience was because mine is literally an echo of her experience. I really wanted to be a pediatrician when I started medical school and was not totally sold by my rotation, but found my way to pediatric radiology. And I actually did back-to-back -back pediatric radiology and interventional radiology electives. And I loved pediatric radiology and I was absolutely turned off by my interventional radiology rotation as a medical student. Because in pediatric radiology, it was very accessible. There were patients, the radiologists were explaining exactly what was going on. It was much more intuitive to somebody with with a background in peds. And then I got to interventional radiology and I had no idea what was going on. Sure, the angiograms were pretty, but I didn't really know what any of them meant. I think I practically fell asleep during a TIPS. It was all just very over my head, which I think is a common experience for a lot of medical students. That all changed when I got to radiology residency and I was also lucky to have just an incredible experience during my residency, just on my second year rotation. Barbara was actually one of my fellows, but they really just made me feel like such a supported part of the team, gave me a lot of independence and really encouraged me to think of myself as an interventional radiologist. And so when people asked what I was going to do, I'd say pediatric radiology, and they kind of give me a look and say pediatric interventional radiology. And eventually the Stockholm syndrome set in and I started thinking to myself, what about pediatric interventional radiology? And I too found myself sitting in our program director's office. So Dr. McWilliams just gave the last talk and he was instrumental in kind of guiding me through what I needed to do if I was serious about doing interventional radiology and then supporting me in my journey towards actually getting here. So thanks to all of my mentors and the people in this panel and in this uh, particular conference who have helped support me to get here. Thanks, Elena, for having me. I feel so honored to be a part of this group of amazing women. So my journey into um, IR, it's so funny, Isabella. It's like it's very similar to yours. I went into medical school thinking I want to do dermatology, specifically Mohs surgery. And then I did my rotation in derm and I just absolutely hated it. So I had to find something different. And then in my um, the clinical years in third, my third year, I, I, I fell in love with surgery. But uh, given the rate, I was I was married at the time, and that was something to take into consideration. Um, the journey of being a surgeon is very challenging as far as balancing the work life with home. So, um, but I was very fortunate to have chiefs on my service, and they mentioned if they had to do it again, they would consider IR. And uh, at my medical school, that I had the fortunate, um, I was fortunate to have, have an elective to do one month of radiology and they allowed me to do an entire month of IR. And of course, that's when I felt, completely fell in love with it. And what I loved about it was uh, the creativity, but most, not only the creativity and the technical stuff, but that team, you know, just being a part of a team, you know, with nurses and techs and, and, and the fellow like physician colleagues and, and just that spirit of um, taking care of the patient. So um, that's how I got into IR and I love it to this day. I don't regret it. And this is, and, I, and um, being a physician is a second career for me. So I wanted to make sure I chose something that was uh, fulfilling and I don't regret it one bit. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you again for having me here. It's such an honor. Um, I had a, a little bit more traditional path of getting to IR. Uh, when I was in medical school, we actually had a mandatory one month rotation in radiology where they rotated you to the different subspecialties in radiology. And at the time, you know, the diagnostic radiology was super boring because you're sitting in a dark room watching someone else read a study. But I really enjoyed my time on IR and in mammography because you, you actually had a significant amount of patient interaction that I didn't know that radiologists did. Um, when I was actually in radiology itself, I, I personally really enjoyed diagnostic radiology. Um, something um, specialties I consider was neuro and MSK uh, because where I trained, uh, these specialties also um, had procedures that they did. But ultimately, what convinced me to go into IR is after I did my IR rotation as a resident, um, I realized that 
no matter how many hours I put in, I just really loved working in IR. Uh, whereas when I was in diagnostic radiology, sometimes by the time four o'clock comes around, you're just counting down the minutes. So that was a very clear cut decision for me. Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, so I discovered IR by happenstance. I entered medical school having no idea what a radiologist was like much of the public. And I um, was introduced during a second year pathophysiology lecture where a woman in a male dominated field, she came to teach us about the chest X-ray and how to find a pneumonia. Um, and from there, I took a one month elective. She became my mentor. And um, the second I saw my first fistulagram of all things, I thought this guy is a wizard. I thought, you know, and it didn't, you know, it didn't strike me till later that a lot of the men in IR were all six feet tall. They were all, they kind of had a similar look to them. So it wasn't until later I realized that like women weren't ubiquitous there, but um, you know, the other things I considered were, uh, I enjoyed my surgery rotation and I meshed with those people, but I had never, never considered surgery because it, to me it was kind of messy. Um, all of the organs looked the same when the body was open. And I, you know, IR just had this beautiful elegance to it where everything was in different imaging modalities was like laid out for you. Um, it was just incredible. So I feel extremely lucky to have found myself here and uh, just am happy for everybody who's listening that you are finding your, your way as well. I also considered family medicine of all things. And I think that speaks to just the variety of things that we see and treat um, and liking patients. Thank you all. Okay, so for the next question, um, as we already went over in the introductions, you're all incredibly impressive individuals and you all have trained in amazing places and you're prolific researchers and educators. Um, many of you are or have been chiefs of your sections and you're known globally for your creative contributions to the field. So I think many of us are sitting at home. I know at least I'm sitting at home and wondering, um, can that be me someday? So what are some traits that we need to aspire to have or skills do we need in order to become strong IRs? And that could include anything within training or anything beyond training. Um, so we would love to hear your advice on this. And so for this, we'll go in the reverse order of the last question. So I think some of the important things uh, for an aspiring IR to have are the desire to work with your hands. That's so integral to what we do. Um, I am extremely visually oriented. So like a couple of the panelists, I considered dermatology before I knew what this field was. Um, because you, if you want to diagnose by what you see, it's so cool to be able to look inside somebody and explain what you're going to do and be the first person to have this realization of what's happening inside of them. Um, and uh, so being visually oriented is massive. Um, and then I would say the third thing is being collaborative. Um, you know, when I go to the doctor's lounge, I, I find that I'm talking to like nearly everyone in there. I <laughs> have time to eat, but uh, I know everybody there. I'm like, I feel like the bell of the ball because I'm always sharing a patient with somebody. They always have a question for me. I'm always able to help. Um, and sometimes, yeah, we share multiple patients. It's just, it's a nice feeling. And if that's something that your personality lends itself to, you may not know. Um, right away. I, I'm not like prom queen, but when I go to the doctor's lounge, I am. <laughs> I, I strongly agree with Dr. Hamilton in everything that she has said, um, especially the part about, you know, you have to enjoy working with our multidisciplinary partners. Um, most of our work that we work in, whether in oncology or even in simple abscess strings, we're always in close communication with our partners in other fields. Uh, and, and that's the part that I actually personally really enjoy. And similar along the line is that um, unlike other radiology um, subfields, this is a field that you really should want and, and 
to own your patients. You want to be able to diagnose your patients. You want to be able to follow up with them. Um, so, so you have to do the, the clinical care from the very beginning to the very end. And sometimes, um, you know, throughout their life, if you are working with cancer patients. Um, so this is not like many other fields where you just pop up an image and then you, you do a dictation and then you finish it off and you sign it off. You never see that patient again. This is something that you really want to um, have the desire to continue to follow up with your patients in. So I echo everyone's um, uh, list of, of traits required to be a strong IR. Uh, the reputation's huge uh, and just the, the conventional three A's being apt, uh, available and um, amicable or whatever. <laughs> So being, you know, very friendly and, and, and um, reaching out to, to colleagues and other specialists and, and just developing your reputation. So then you're going to get direct referrals. And, and um, I think that's, that's super important. But on top of that, I think it's important to be fearless, fearless in, um, you know, trying new things, um, especially in the field. You know, our field is so technologically, you know, advanced and fearless in meeting new people. I think that's really, really important. And then the last thing is um, the ability to listen and to know who you are. Um, so I guess that's two more things. So, you know, li listen, meaning, you know, when, when you're talking, to, whether you're talking to patients or talking to referrals and then knowing who you are is, I mean, I think we, I can probably go on a, a long kind of like diatribe of that, but it's important to know what you want and where you want to be and then, um, you know, get there. But I'm sure those other questions will kind of get us to answer that, but those are my, uh, list of traits that are important. Um, the first two that I can think of go sort of hand in hand. One of the things that first drew me to the field is how much problem solving there is. So I have a real love for finding creative solutions to the challenges that arrive on a daily basis is important. The other thing that I think I've learned to model myself after and some of the best interventional radiologists that I've had the privilege to work with um, is a sense of patience. So problems will arise, even in basic cases. And some people get mad, they throw things, they yell, and other people just take a step back, they reassess, and they work through what their options are, and they come up with those creative problem-solving uh, solutions. So I think those first two characteristics really are synergistic and are really important for accomplishing new and novel things, and even for sometimes just helping somebody get a basic procedure done. The final thing is uh, really, remember, really remembering our patients as people. And I think that we are privileged in interventional radiology to have so much patient contact. And so I think empathy is the most important third thing. If you can make a real human connection with your patients, I think that makes you a stronger and better doctor and a stronger and better interventional radiologist. I think I'm lucky because um, such wonderful um, women have said uh, such important things. So I get to sort of just put the cherry on top, but I agree with all of my colleagues here. Um, they've shown um, enormous wisdom in how they've described the traits. Um, I would add to that creativity um, and creativity is uh, one of the hallmarks of a, a good IR because um, all the situations, and here I have my sidekick, um, all the situations, um, that come up are, are not necessarily prescribed. So you might have to find new and innovative ways. And that's part of the fun of it um, is to have that opportunity. Um, it's also important to be creative because many times we're forging our own paths and these are roads that we have to pave. And so um, not accepting sort of the prescribed roads that are there, but um, realizing that um, this, this career and um, this opportunity is yours to make um, and yours to define. And in some ways, rules don't really apply to you in the same way because you can pursue um, the type of career that you want in any sort of manifestation. That applies also to having kids. And I saw um, on the chat that somebody asked, can you have kids while you're in IR? Well, this is one and he looks pretty okay. And I got another one. <laughs> Uh, who both who I had as an attending and then my first one um, I had as a resident and so absolutely I worked up to the very end in fact um, with this guy I did uh, um, I was actually actively in labor while doing uh, um, a liver biopsy so that's possible um, 
I think it's also important to have, um, to be resilient. So there is a toughness of skin that is required uh, without a willingness to accept um, abuse. And so the tough skin comes from not taking things um, personally, but um, regarding failures as growth opportunities rather than a moment to like um, kind of come undone. And so, you know, we deal with very intense situations and I didn't really predict that I would be the kind of person who would, um, as Arky said, just kind of take a step back and get cool. And that I was really happy to find out that that's the kind of person I am. It's like when everyone gets crazy, like I kind of go down and that actually ends up making, um, making my job um, much more, um, you know, a, a better job, a, a better job that I can do and also a much better relationship with the people I work with. I think I did three. I sort of uh, um, alluded to everybody's stuff. <laughs> There's more than three and you all build on each other. So those are really great responses. Um, for the interest of time, for the next question, I was going to have all of you answer, but I think what we'll do is we'll just have two of you verbally answer and then three of you can answer in the chat and address all of the, all of the um, attendees with the next question. So you can disregard the order for the next question and any two who would like to talk can talk and we'll do that for the rest of the questions. So this one, and Dr. Newton kind of alluded to this already as well as some of our other panelists. So how have you set and prioritized and balanced goals for both your personal and professional lives? Okay, I'm listening first, so I'll just go ahead and talk. So uh, this, <laughs> this is very challenging, I mean, to be quite honest. Um, and what's really critical is that support at home. So having a partner who would fully support your career. And, and here's the thing with, with partnership or being in a relationship. Um, someone has to, sadly, sadly, or at least in my experience, someone has to um, sacrifice, you know, whether it be sacrificing time, sacrificing their own careers, because really time is a big currency when it comes to having both a really great professional as well as personal life. So, um, so this is not an easy question to answer. So how do you set, prioritize? So, so you set your goals and you kind of make them lofty but then you have to bring it down to reality. Um, so that's when you prioritize. And that's when you talk to your partner about figuring out, you know, do you want to, um, you know, so a couple things is, you know, uh, do you want to start your career being inward facing and developing your reputation inwardly or outwardly or, 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 you know, eventually you want both, right? So inward facing is kind of developing your reputation at the hospital where you're working, building your career, staying in the same, you know, in, in the same job. Um, they say that many, Many people, you know, with their first job, they're, they, they're not in it for longer than three years. I mean, I've been fortunate that I've been at UC Davis since I finished my fellowship. So uh, I, I've had the, the, you know, kind of opportunity to really build my career inwardly. But think about the point where it's important to like um, move outwardly and be more, um, and, you know, plugged into societies and, 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 and conferencing and things like that. So, but with that, that doesn't come without a cost, you know, with, with family life and back to time, you know, it, it's really, it's really tough. So I'm going to let another person speak on this because I can't say that I'm an, an expert on that at all. Um, I want to just add something here. As I mentioned in the chat, I had a baby about 11 months ago, and that was maybe in my second year of being an attending. And I think the thing that's most important for me to make clear in this particular panel discussion is that it's okay at times to prioritize your personal life, and it's okay at times to prioritize your professional life. And even more importantly, it's okay to feel like you're failing at both simultaneously, literally all the time. So I think it's really important, as Dr. Vu mentioned, to set goals. And I think it's as important to realize that you may not meet those goals. It's important to have a really, really frank and open conversation about what your job means and what the requirements are on your time. Being a doctor is not flexible. And as a result of that, a lot of the important challenges that come with being a parent and a partner often um, are, are disproportionately on our spouses and partners. And I think that it's really important to make sure that you are cognizant of the fact that you're more than just you. Um, you're part of a family, you're part of a partnership, you're part of a career. And at different times throughout your life, each of those elements can be first and that can be okay. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. We can do the same thing. Um, so how were you all able to find 
mentors throughout your training process. Um, was it really difficult to find people that you identified with? Um, and just to make things easier, I'm just gonna go ahead and call on uh, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Cote for this question. Okay. Um, yeah, I always found this concept kind of intimidating. And um, when you're a medical student, you think you need to find the perfect mentor and they're gonna set you up. And um, I think that it's been a learning curve for me. I think a lot of my mentorship relationships have happened organically. I'm very grateful. I feel like I've had, you know, a hundred mentors. And um, another thing I would say is uh, in residency, we had a lecture, somebody put up a slide about the concept of having like a full roster, like a board of advisors. I think that's a fantastic concept so that you, you know, like you're not gonna come to me for research mentoring. I, I don't, I'm hardly involved. Uh, but you would go to one of these other amazing panelists or, <laughs> you know, someone else. So, you know, everybody will have their strengths and weaknesses as far as ability to guide you. And I mean, challenges in finding people you identify with, you wouldn't know it from this panel, but IR is actually just eight to 9% female. So uh, yeah, when I was growing up in diagnostic residency in New England, uh, the next IR was not in my state. The next female IR was in Boston. So, um, and then there was this rumor, there was somebody, somebody new in uh, Minnesota. So <laughs> because of time zones, I never connected with her. So it's, it's hard when you feel like you're geographically separated from people and you just don't have anyone who you feel like you could directly identify with. So yeah, had great role models, but I mean, some of my role models were like fishing in the morning before cases and while their wife did all the, the child rearing and uh, moving off to school. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't exactly a picture that I could directly identify with. I wasn't sure I was supposed to go next, but uh, um, so, you know, I was very lucky that I had great mentors throughout my life. Um, you know, Maureen Kohi being one of the significant women in my life who guided my path in IR. Um, but uh, I would like to echo what Dr. Luhar is saying in the chat, book, uh, ch uh, chat box is that you can have different mentors for different aspects of life and you can have mentors from different paths. So if, when, you know, you have a woman in IR that is a mentor, they understand the little things you go through, like the little, you know, interactions you may have here with your colleagues, with your nurses or your techs, because you're a woman. Um, but it is also very important to get the perspective of mentors who are different from you, um, such as, so my mentor currently is John Kaufman, right? He will give me a different perspective on how to interpret a situation. Um, so it, in terms of identifying your mentor, I think uh, it's useful to find a mentor that has a similar background to you, but also one that has a very different background from you. So having that uh, really balance it out for you. Thank you. Okay, and this will be our last question um, for which I will have Dr. Vu and Dr. Newton respond verbally, and then the remaining panelists, um, feel free to go ahead and respond in the chat and then we can move on to the next section after this. So um, what challenges did you face in trying to enter and pursue your leadership positions in a field that has so few female positions and how can those challenges be mitigated for other females interested in entering this field? Dr. Vu? This is a heavy one. I was hoping you were gonna call on Dr. Newton first <laughs> and then I could just echo everything she says. Um, uh, let's see for leadership positions. So um, here's the thing. I mean, you, you, I just, I never, I never kind of like looked at myself as being female, you know, you just kind of, you, you be you and you just need to know, back to you need to know yourself. Uh, I think it's really important um, to have clear goals and then, and then ask yourself what drives you and then move in that direction. And, but, you know, back to the whole, like not, not identifying myself. I, of course I identify myself as a female, but, um, but, but not making that like a, you know, making myself stand out for my colleagues. So um, uh, I think it's really important to, in general, just be very like unapologetic. I find that women in medicine in general, or when they speak, they're always saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I mean, it drives me nuts. And, you know, so that's really un important to be unapologetic. Um, it's important to um, 
just approach conflicts in general because we will encounter conflicts at work and and with you know in, in so many different kind of like scenarios but to be very measured and calm you know um in your approach and yeah you know, and, and honestly we all know that there are um uh biases and um what's the word um as far as like the crazy female doctor, right? Or you have something to prove and, you know, um, so, so you're overreacting. I think that's really just really important to, to know yourself and, and, and not to feed into some of these like expectations that people have of like a strong female leader, you know, just be yourself and, and back to know who you are, know your goals and, um, and, and surround yourself around people who, who respect you um, and, and who trust and, and who you can trust and, and who will support you. I bet Isabel has more, um, more, more insightful thoughts. No, I, I think that's a great, what you say is great because, um, you know, I actually never set out to look for leadership positions. I'm the kind of person who, um, if there is somebody in the room who is capable and willing to be a leader, then I will support them. But if there's nobody in the room to do that, then I will do it. So, um, I'm not a, um, an automatic leader. Um, you know, actually SIR has a really great course in leadership and it has the DCIS kind of, you know, um, scale where you learn what type of leader you are and I'm, I'm an I, so like, I'm a big picture kind of person. Um, you know, I'm a communicator, um, but I don't have ambitions to be, um, you know, section chief at a big place. I ended up sort of default at, at, at the VA or chair or anything like that. Um, all of my leadership positions have been um, organic. Um, and I find that, you know, we talk about the difficulties of being a woman in a male dominated field, but there's also opportunity in that. And again, that goes back to resilience. Uh, and the opportunity is um, a lot of our male colleagues, and I would say a majority, at least my experience, um, are very interested in supporting um, our careers. They are advocates has been my experience. And, um, you know, it, uh, Barbara was saying the, the you know, closest IR in um, her area was, you know, not even in her area. Well, for me, there are two women IRs in my county and the other one is Ann Roberts. So talk about like heavy. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that um, there's a lot of support for us, um, but I think we're hard on ourselves. So, you know, Catherine was saying, um, that, you know, we have these expectations and, you know, it's, it's hard to balance, um, you know, uh, family and, um, and this, you know, tendency towards um, apologizing. That's a big, a big deal. But I think we need to be kinder to ourselves and realize, do we really want this leadership position? Why? And if we do, um, we should not just uh, rely on each other as women um, to get to that position and to do it successfully, but also on our male colleagues who, um, you know, for a large part are quite supportive. And I'm not going to apologize for that little guy, but he absolutely loves to, um, you know, come into every Zoom meeting that I have. I, it's just how he is. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to each of our panelists. Um, I'm sorry, it was kind of a rush, um, but I encourage you to keep answering questions um, that pop up in the chat if you guys have time to stay on. And with that, we're gonna to go to our next section, which is the program director panel. And that'll be moderated by Dr. Millie Lau, who's a third year IR resident at Loma Linda University. And Sapan is a medical student at Western University. So I will give it to them. Thank you so much, Helena. Um, so, Moving on to our um, program directors section. Um, Sipan, would you like to start introducing um, some of our attendings here? Yes, for sure. Um, thank you for the introduction. Yes, my name is Sipan Molej. I'm a third year medical student at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. Uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for their time and their support here and also everyone who's attending. So I'll start with a brief introduction. Um, and I'm also going to just share uh, my screen. Okay. All right. So yeah, we have um, 
Dr. Quinn Messenger, who is the program director of the independent and integrated IR program at UC San Diego. Um, he completed his IR uh, fellowship at University of Pennsylvania uh, School of Medicine, and he's very focused in research, particularly in um, arterial embolization, as well as chemical gallbladder sclerosis and radiation protection. Uh, we have Dr. Scott Fujimoto, who's the program director of uh, IR and um, of the integrated and independent IR program at Loma Linda University, where he also uh, completed his uh, fellowship. And uh, he also is a very incredible uh, mentor for students and regularly uh, posts very helpful information on his Instagram page at, uh, at Doc Fuji. Uh, and next we have Dr. Ryan Shenning, who's the program director of the um, Integrated and Independent IR program at uh, OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, where he also completed both his uh, diagnostic radiology uh, residency and IR fellowship program. Uh, and his clinical interests are mainly in aortic interventions, hepatobiliary disease, and peripheral arter uh, arterial disease. Uh, so next I'll move it to. And as previously introduced, um, Dr. Daikin Cherry, he's the IR program director at Kaiser LA. Dr. Woodhead, he's the IR program director at University of Arizona. Dr. Vu is at UC Davis. Dr. Chick is at University of Washington. Um, so for our questions, um, we'll be directing each question to a couple of our attendings. Um, and if the remaining attendings could voice their answers within the chat box, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so first starting off with Dr. Messinger and Dr. Fujimoto, um, what should an applicant look for within a program? God, do you wanna go first? I can. Sure, oh, I can go first, I guess. Um, well, starting off with something that uh, when you guys are first starting off and deciding that you wanna go into IR, you're seeing and hearing from all of us and you're seeing the incredible IR procedures that we do, um, The amount of creativity and um, that goes into it. But I think of what's often overlooked in when you're looking at um, interventional radiology programs is the quality, both the quality and the integration of the diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology programs. Um, what you, a lot of people don't realize is the majority of your your training is going to be in diagnostic radiology, oftentimes in a three-year block. Um, so you want to be sure that it's a place that one will train you well, and two will train you well within the three-year um, constraint that you have. Um, another thing that you need to look at is how integrated are the programs? Will you be able to, you know, do you have to wait three years before you step foot in an IR suite? Hopefully that isn't the case, that it's integrated throughout your five years that you're able to um, have both uh, kind of longitudinal care with your patients, a continuity clinic, being able to uh, participate in patients, uh, patient care from the clinic visit to the, to the, um, to the actual procedure, to the post-procedural care. Um, I think that's very important in order to be able to learn how you how we truly um, treat our patients um, in, a, in a continuous manner. Um, so that's often overlooked. I think people stress a lot about, you know, when they're on their interview days, and I apologize for a lot of you who are either interviewing or about to interview on the Zoom trail. It is really difficult, and I acknowledge that's very difficult to really get a feel of, of, of a program and to get a feel of what the residents go through day to day, um, but try to take advantage of those opportunities you get to talk to the residents because you really wanna see if they're very happy with their program, but a lot of programs are gonna put their happiest residents um, you know, forward on these, on these meet and greets. So try to find out why they're happy, whether it's because of the location that they're at, because of the relationships they have with their attendings, the mentorships that they form? Is it the support systems that are put into place? Um, and a lot of that has to do with the diagnostic program. What are the, you know, what, what um, wellness programs are put into place? Um, what, how do we reach out to struggling residents? Um, how, how um, you know, what, what type of, um, 
what type of activities do do you go on and you know overall you know it, see if you can you know it's all about finding your fit so see if it's a, a place you can see yourself and you have to know how to ask the right questions to, to do that yeah i echo what uh, dr fujimoto said i mean mostly it's a cultural fit um which obviously is becoming more difficult with the zoom uh, interviews but they're, they're all, you almost always can get a sense of the cultural uh, aspects of the program. And then number two is kind of, I always say is accelerated autonomy. So, you know, are you getting in procedures early? Are you getting in with the senior residents? Are they helping you work through cases? And then probably number three is that you always got to remember that you're interviewing for both the IR and DR program. Uh, Dr. Fujimoto also mentioned that. So you're going to have to fit with both. So don't consider, you have to consider it a complete package for everywhere you go. You're never just going to have an isolated IR program. It's always going to have a sister uh, DR program. So make sure that they're both fits for you because like they said, like he said, three years starts in DR pretty much universally. Perfect. Thank you for those responses. Uh, so next, the next question, I'm going to be directing it uh, to Dr. Shenning and Dr. Vatican and Cherry, but as Dr. Lau mentioned, any of the other panelists, if you could uh, put your thoughts in the chat box, we would appreciate it. Uh, so what would, in general, a program director uh, look in an application or for an, in an applicant? Ryan, you want to take it first? Yeah, I can go, I can go first, Joji. Um, that's, so that's a great question. Uh, for those of us who are uh, part of both the integrated and independent, uh, uh, you know, programmatic leadership at our institutions, we review a lot of applications. Um, so when I am looking at, at a person's application, uh, I, I try to really assess for some of those three A's qualities. Um, availability, affability, uh, you know, and ability. So we're, we're going to train you uh, to be able. Um, uh, but as, as medical students go through their clinical rotations, I like to look at the, at the dean's letter and some of the, the rotation evaluations to, uh, you know, really assess what kind of citizen you are, what kind of, how, you know, what are the, the intangibles, the professionalism qualities? IR is a very, very difficult specialty. We work long hours and, um, you know, having, having really high board scores is great. Uh, but, you know, being on call with me during a busy weekend where we're sometimes awake for over 30 hours straight, 40 hours straight, uh, you know, your, your, your step one score doesn't always uh, translate into, you know, what, what kind of, a, uh, you know, what kind of a, a physician teammate you're going to be, um, uh, you know, on, on service. So that's one of the things that I really try to look for when I'm going through applications, uh, both in your letters of recommendation and on your sort of, you know, the MSPE, the, the Dean's Letter uh, evals from your clinical clerkships. Joji? Yeah, um, so I'll just kind of go from my perspective. Yeah, so I, I was a DRPD before an IRPD. So the reason why the step scores are important, at least historically, is because of the, core, of the oral boards or the core exam, the, the amount of information we had to learn. So I wouldn't take that lightly. And so that's one thing that uh, the, you know we will have some concern about. Now, step one's going away, so we may reflect on step two. And then you have a lot of applicants, so you have to figure out ways to kind of streamline the process. Um, we'll use location of where you're from or where your school is to kind of guide your interest in being there. Um, step scores, um, letters of recommendation. If you know, someone on the panel gives me a letter, I'll call them, go, hey, what do you really think? You know, are they are they able to handle this? Um, I think those are kind of the key things. Your scores in internal medicine and surgery are very important. And I agree with Ryan, a good step one score doesn't make you a good IR. You pass the boards, but it doesn't make you a good BIR position. Um, you, you're right. You want to be able to be available and applicable. And, and I want to be able to interact with you. And you better take care, very good care of your patients. So that's what I'm looking for. And you have to have a decent work ethic. These are long hours, busy days. And you have to be come in with a smile in the early morning and leave with a smile at the end of the day. That's what we kind of expect. And then, oh, sorry, it's a couple other things. That are, are you involved in SIR? If you're not involved in SIR, it's kind of a question mark. Um, 
Now you may be a later arriver, but I still want to see like you're a med student member, maybe you're a reserves member. Lindsay Arndt can send you a text to like to guide how you get there or on the chat. Um, did you do some research, uh, preferably IR research or surgical research is kind of what I'm personally looking for. That's pretty much my main thoughts. Thank you for your responses. Um, next question is to Dr. Woodhead and Dr. Vu. Um, can you speak to the importance of research experience and extracurricular activities? Definitely. Dr. Vu, do you want to go first or what do you think? Okay, well, I'm happy to talk about uh, research experience and uh, extracurriculars. You know, um, we, we, you know, I think in general, um, any evidence of research experience, you know, learning to drive a project, um, learning to, uh, you know, ask uh, questions in an you know, experimental fashion is kind of essential to, uh, an essential part of the job, uh, you know, given that IR involves so much problem solving. Um, kind of on the on the spot. I think it's really excellent to have people who have you know curious minds and like to address um, scientific questions. Now, do you have to have research in IR uh, specifically? You know, it certainly helps. Um, but I think any kind of enthusiasm um, for research, either benchtop or uh, translational or purely you know running a clinical study, is uh, and really any area is great. Um, you know. There are very, very easy ways to get involved as a medical student um, in research. Um, I think reaching out to mentors locally, uh, putting together um, a small research project, which could turn into either a poster presentation at SIR or an actual you know, uh, scientific abstract um, are fantastic ways to get involved. Uh, and you know, I think having that, having that on your resume is essential. I, I think it's, uh, it's also it makes for a great conversation material during an interview. Um, so I think, you know, when you're when you're thinking about uh, things to bring up, or um, it, it gives you an opportunity to to talk about interests that you have, uh, maybe within within specifically with within uh, within IR or or areas that you're uh, you know interested, in just to kind of uh, you know, differentiate yourself in the actual interview. So that's kind of how I think about. Um, the importance of, of uh, having research when you're, uh, when you're a candidate. Um, I don't know, any other thoughts, guys? So in regards to, I, I think you gotta have something, but it really comes down to, it's not what the research, can you, um, it's not the specific research, because I'd rather have an applicant that has like listed two things and they're actually super productive in that project versus an applicant who's listed 20, you know, research projects and can barely talk about it. Because it does come, come down to, you know, what, so being a part of research or scholarly work, you're, you're, you're in a team and, and how do you work in that team and, and what you've learned from it and, 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 the, and um, what, what, what you've contributed and, and did it lead to you know something productive? I think that's super important because that shows that you have the wherewithal, you have the um, courage, you have you have the smarts, you have all that stuff to kind of get through um, just challenges when it comes to residency. And then as far as extracurriculars, it's the same thing. So you know, skiing, running, blah blah blah, all that stuff that everybody says, art, music, you know, that's great. But um, how does how has that developed you into the person you are? Um, so those are, it's good to have them, but you need to know how to, you know, talk about it and then be ready for questions that are uh, at least, you know, when you interview with me, like questions like, how has this like changed you as a person, as a human being or, or contributed to your growth and development in, in your, in, in, in your uh, like me medicine life or your future career as a doctor? Thank you very much for your very informative responses. Um, next question, I'm gonna be directing it to Dr. Check and Dr. Messenger. And it's about perhaps more directed towards COVID. And we know prior to COVID away rotations uh, were very good opportunities uh, that were available for students. So now with COVID and many sites not being available or not uh, taking students on at this point for external rotations, uh, how would you advise the students um, you know, what would you advise they should do or what would be the best way for them to be able to fill that gap? Well, I think a certain, a lot of programs these days have a uh, sort of formalized electronic elective. 
So if you can become involved in your own personal electronic collective or at the various institutions out there, I think that's helpful. Or just try to be involved as much as you can in your current uh, institution. And I think we're all very well aware of the challenges, not from only the applicant side, but from our side as well. And uh, I think we try not to, uh, we take that all into consideration. I think it's a difficult time. It's difficult for all of us, uh, but I think hang in there and we'll kind of all make it through. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that hopefully for the med students behind this current match class that we're probably going to have at least rotations, outside rotations coming soon, I would hope, particularly as most of the healthcare providers get vaccinated. So I know that at UCSD, we're kind of pushing it uh, a little bit aggressively to try to get some outside rotators so that we can have face-to-face -face interactions with the applicants. So this year was an abnormal year, of course, but I hope that it will kind of return to some semblance of normal. So um, I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that at their specific programs, but I think everybody's uh, got the Zoom fatigue, of course, and that we'd like to try to open up these opportunities for you guys. Thank you. And summing off of that, um, our next question to Dr. Fujimoto and Dr. Shenning. Um, so if rotations are available, how can students stand out successfully during the rotation? Um, and also on top of that, on interview day. Scott, you want to go first? Um, okay. Um, you know, this is something that I've, I've addressed a few times um, on my Instagram because it's, uh, it is a, a challenge to stand out on rotations, especially if you're someone like myself who is a little more introverted, a little less comfortable talking in front of groups. <laughs> so, um, I mean, getting that, that label, that quiet label on rotations, or it, it, like, it permeates into your MSPE even in your dean's letter. You know, you, you, the, it'll be mentioned. And it's not, it's not always a negative, but it can definitely be perceived as a negative by people who are reviewing, especially if you're applying to a surgical type field like IR, um, where assertiveness is, is um, more, more valued. So getting that mark of being a quiet student is, it can be seen as, as negative. So one is to just, one strategy is to you know, embrace the fact that you're quiet and to be prepared to address it in interviews. Um, because it, it'll probably be asked about if it's in your MSPE. You could say you're the type of person you don't like to draw unnecessary attention to yourself, but you know, but that you like to concentrate on providing good patient care and follow it up with a positive statement about your assertiveness. Like, you, but however, you're the type of person that will speak up and stand for like what you believe in. Um, another strategy is just to kind of break out of your shell a little bit and there's a few just really easy ways to do that. One is to just smile more um, on, when you're on rotation. Don't avoid eye contact. People who, who give good eye contact and smile more are just automatically not seen as, as shy. Um, two, and this is super easy and a lot of students just don't take advantage of it, is just ask more questions. I mean, it's, it's, to, to be honest, students really don't ask as many questions as they should. Um, you know, so just have a strategy of, you know, how you will ask better, more relevant questions during rounds. And that's something that, you know, it shows that you're interested, you're engaged. Um, and then the last strategy is to kind of figure out how to sell yourself, um, not at the expense of others, obviously not jumping in and giving answers ahead of the residents, but, um, you know, bringing up things that you read, bringing up conversations that you have with your patients, because you know, we don't know you're reading. We don't know you're seeing these patients uh, unless that, it, you know, unless you, you let us know. So don't be afraid to do that. Say that, oh, you know, if something comes up relevant that you, that we read about, say, oh, I read this article on, you know, managing hypertension, you know, prior to a renal biopsy the other night. I wonder if we need to consider this or this, or, you know, oh, I saw, you know, Mrs. X last night after her procedure, you know, we had a long conversation. She has such and such concerns. You know, that shows us that you have initiative, that you actually care about the patient itself and not just the procedure. So don't be afraid to, you know, bring up those in, in kind of a, a way that's just, that's not obnoxious. And I think you'll, you'll do well. Yeah, I think that the most successful med students on, on our service are the ones who are able to, you know, again, not to harp on the, on the three A's, but they, they come early, they stay late. 
they they figure out ways to become engaged members of the team. Um, you know, a lot of times by asking our fellows and residents, you know, what can I do to be helpful? Um, and then, and then, uh, yeah, I agree with Scott. I mean, the, the ones who, who, who show evidence of patient ownership and also reading up on procedures, uh, you know, to increase their level of preparedness and also their, their level of, you know, of, of understanding of what it is that we do. Oftentimes, you know, it's very complex things that we're doing. Uh, those are the med students that really stand out the most on our service. Um, and, uh, you know, and it agreed, it does take a, 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 you know, a level of social IQ that sometimes has nothing to do with their, the, their, their smarts. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that on the attending side, if, if somebody is quiet and, and uh, a little bit more uh, reluctant, you know, we, we, can, we can do more on our, our side to kind of bring out uh, and engage those med students as well. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what I would say in response to that. And some really great responses in the chat box too about what other people, uh, you know, would look for and would recommend med students doing. Great, thank you so much for your answers as well as, yeah, all the answers we see in the chat, they're all amazing. Um, and my last question was actually, this is being directed to all the panelists and we would appreciate it if everyone could uh, sort of give uh, one piece of advice that, uh, you know, if you were to give one piece of advice, what would it be to someone who is um, considering and hoping to apply uh, for IR? And we could go down the list that we have on the screen. We could start from uh, Dr. Vatican Cherry, Dr. Woodhead, Dr. Fujimoto, and then so on. Yeah, I mean, just being present first, I mean, show, showing up at a, many of these kind of virtual symposia, et cetera, getting your kind of name out there to showcase your interest is probably what I would say is number one. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, you're, it's really the relationships you build with uh, the residents and fellows on the IR service, first and foremost, um, I think really are, are going to lead to, you know, future success kind of, um, you know, word, word of mouth travels, I think, certainly. So becoming a good member of the team, as Dr. Vu pointed out earlier, is essential. And, uh, the, the, you know, if the, if the fellows and the attendings become comfortable with you, they're going to, you know, do anything possible to to help you be successful with your career. I think, you know, we, we certainly, uh, some of the things that we take the most seriously and that we get the greatest satisfaction out of are seeing our, our med students do well and, and uh, get into excellent programs nationally. So it's, uh, you know, it, it is something we take, we, you know, get a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, six, you know, uh, uh, satisfaction from, so. Uh, I would say get involved early, definitely um, join SIR, join the Medical Student Council and the RFS um, to see how you can get involved in as many projects as possible. We like to see applicants that just have a very good understanding of what interventional radiology is, and that's a great way to, to one, just learn more about it, and two, uh, decide whether it's something that you really are passionate about. Um, then. You can make great relationships. You can network. Um, definitely, networking is key. It's a it's a small a small specialty. A lot of us know each other very well, and you know, uh, a good word from one of colleagues, especially the colleagues that I know on this panel, you know, goes a long way. Um, I agree with everybody. Obviously, already, I would say I like to get emails kind of early in the process but during your fourth year. If you're interested, a lot of times people have specific regions that they want to be in and obviously if San Diego is specific for me so if people have ties here or something and they're very interested in the program I like to know so it's one of these things where I could be on the lookout for you or get you involved early particularly with our conferences virtually and stuff so um, that may pile up our inboxes but at least it helps me kind of sort through who's interested specifically in programs regards to just that then just applications later on. Can you repeat the question again just so I'm actually answering specifically what you're asking yes of course it's, it's basically we are just asking each of the panels if you could give uh, one advice to um people who are students who are considering applying to ir okay so i mean i think i was so 
to, um, I think it's important to know your past failures and, and how you handled that. And, um, and because to succeed is to know how you failed and not, not, not to have failures. Uh, so to recognize it and then um, know how you overcame it and then how did it change you and, and how would that contribute to success in the future. So if that can be conveyed somehow through your application, through the multiple applications that we have to go through, I think that'd be great. I, I can go if, if Jeff isn't going to go. Um, I, I would say just to kind of echo the, the get involved early sentiment, um, I, you know, obviously this depends on, on when you have early exposure to IR and what, you know, when you know that you want to, to do IR or potentially do IR, but in terms of, um, you know, getting involved early, if you are doing a project or you do rotations and you kind of identify an IR mentor, um, that really is reflected in your letters. So, uh, you know, I know um, sort of instantly whether Dr. Vatican Cherry has worked closely with somebody uh, within kind of the opening five sentences of his letter uh, versus, you know, other other people who maybe, uh, you know, haven't spent as much time either on his clinical service or doing projects or whatnot. So taking a leadership role on a project with an identified mentor um, lends itself to, you know, it strengthens your application and that you can get a letter that is, that is very strong from somebody who knows you uh, both in the angio suite and you know in, in throughout the course of navigating a, a research project so that would be my one piece of advice thank you so much i don't know if uh, dr chick is still there um well thank you for all the program directors and uh your answers and now i will hand over the session to uh Nifjit. Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, so we're getting towards the, uh, the end of our day. Again, I thank you all uh, for your help on the program director panel, as well as the women in IR panel. Uh, we're we're going to be starting the resident panel now, uh, and then we'll also be having a device vendor uh, breakout session uh, after this. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Millie Lau, uh, integrated resident at uh, Loma Linda University, Henry Zato, uh, who is an integrated resident at uh, Christiana Care. Zaim Billa, who is an integrated resident at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles. Melinda Wang, who's a integrated resident at UCSF. And Abi Jareem, who's an integrated resident at UCSD. All of you can start uh, sharing your cameras and uh, we can go ahead and get started with the resident panel. And again, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I have the chat open right here uh, for everyone in the audience. Um, and uh, I'll make sure to get through some questions. So just to kind of start off, um, maybe uh, we can split it off. Uh, Millie and Henry, maybe you can start this one. Um, how did you discover interventional radiology? What was your path to IR? Um, and then everyone else can answer in the chat, similar to the other sessions. Sure, so I first found out about IR completely randomly. Um, UCLA has their annual conference um, and uh, my school just sent out an email thread saying, hey, there's this conference that's available, um, come check it out. And so I went and I found out to be very, very intriguing, um, very similar to how this um, conference is set up, a bunch of great speakers, um, lots of very interesting cases. Um, and I just fell in love with the merge of um, medicine, inner, you know, intervention and also uh, creativity behind IR. Um, and so since then, I um, just try to get more involved and plugged in, um, learning more about the field itself, um, doing some research at either at UCLA and with Kaiser LA, um, and then doing away rotations. And so that's how I kind of got plugged into, uh, sucked into IR. Same, uh, I had a similar path to Millie. It was actually Navjeet um, who came, I went to Toro, California, so we both, he's a year ahead of me, um, but he came and to our sort of imaging club, gave us a little talk about IR. I was, I didn't know what IR was, you know, 
showed all these fancy tools and angiograms and I didn't even know what I was looking at, but I had enough interest where um, I reached out to UCSF, um, actually Dr. Conrad, who gave the trauma talk and he sort of let me shadow him. And after that, I was, was sort of hooked, just like as Millie said, once you sort of get involved in IR, see a couple procedures, it's very um, addicting. So uh, after that, did some more shadowing, worked on some projects and then uh, come forth here did a lot, of, a lot of the same things that Millie did, a lot of away rotations, um, got involved in SIR, um, specifically through the IR interest group, group committee. And, um, and I think that sort of, you know, introduced me to the small world of IR, um, attended SIR at LA in 2018, and just met a lot of uh, wonderful people. All right, thank you very much. So the next question I'll address to Melinda and Zaim. Um, what other specialties were you considering before IR uh, and what drew you to IR? Yeah, I can start off with that one. So uh, I kind of ended up discovering IR in a roundabout way. Originally, I thought I wanted to do something procedural, something with my hands. Um, and that also panned out during my third year. The, the rotations I loved the most were surgery and OBGYN. But I just didn't necessarily love the culture of those fields. And so I did a little more digging and that's how I ended up finding IR. And I think that's a common thread that I've heard among many of my IR residents uh, is that we all loved surgery. We loved doing things with our hands, but we wanted something, a field that was a little more collaborative, a little more cutting edge and a little friendlier, which is important. Um, so other specialties that I considered, I mentioned some of the surgical subspecialties, OBGYN, but at the end of the day, I think the culture of IR uh, and the ability for technological innovation is what solidified my choice. Yeah, so um, I kind of echo what Melinda said. I needed to do something with my hands for sure. And I'm someone who likes to do things that are very fast paced. And so really the only other thing I would have considered is a surgical subspecialty or general surgery even. But I found uh, vascular and interventional radiology actually very early on as a first year. I went to the angiography suite and I saw about five different procedures in different organ systems. And that just drew me to the field even more because you, know, you wanna be a master of the entire body. That's what I wanted personally because you learn so much in medical school and you know you just want to apply everything you've learned rather than forgetting it by doing something you know maybe a little too specialized where you can lose a lot of your knowledge and that was something that was very important to me and so that's how I ended up choosing vascular and interventional radiology over any of the other procedural fields was just the breadth of the things we do is incredible so um, that's how I ended up here. Perfect. So really quickly, uh, Abby and Millie, um, could you talk about, I know you have some research that you've, uh, you've done. Can you talk about how you found those opportunities and kind of how you accelerated those projects? Sure, Millie, do you wanna go first or? Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, uh, the, I think mentorship is huge and Dr. Newton, Dr. Vu, Dr. Meisinger, and Dr. V, they all, they all already touched on this, but basically, uh, I think, you know, at least for me, uh, I'm pretty open in regards to like what I want to research and things that I'm still exploring and stuff. So I think it's really important just to find a good mentor that can inspire you in a topic that you might be interested in. And once you're in residency and even as a medical student, I think there's a plethora of research opportunities. It's all about just uh, one, being open-minded and two, uh, taking the initiative just to contact people on a topic that they might be interested in. You can see what everybody does online essentially. And so you can just always shoot an email saying, hey, I'm interested in this and this, I read this about this. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's just an, always an opportunity to get involved from that from that way, you know, just be proactive basically. Yeah, and in addition to that, um, so the medical school that I came from, we didn't, we weren't big on research. Um, I was at Western um, out in California. Um, so I had to reach out to, you know, John Moriarty out at UCLA, um, Dr. V, um, and the network in that way, since my home institution didn't really have those opportunities available. Um, 
but I feel like research is a huge um, opportunity for students uh, to use that to get to know residents and attendings um, and to build that relationship, right? So um, as our previous speakers and program directors were alluding to, um, for residents, you can train residents how to uh, be sufficient in the medicine part of things, but you can't really train residents in the sense of their work ethic and their um, personality and um, all of that stuff. So I say that more so as for research opportunities, those are avenues and platforms for medical students to get to know um, attendings and residents and um, show them that, hey, like I'm a hard worker, um, I'm very easy to get along with, um, and I have input, you know, in these projects. Um, so that's kind of my uh, input with um, using research as a avenue to, to network. All right. Um, again, I'll, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, feel free to type any questions that you have uh, in, the, in the chat box over there and I'll, I'll address them to the residents. Uh, but for the next question, I'll, I'll address this to, to Henry and Zayim. Could you talk a little bit about what your day is? experience, as you know, many of you on this panel even have noticed um, after doing a ways here, it, it is really a crazy program to be at. So my typical day, you know, I start, I get in uh, probably anytime about like 530 to 6, pre-round on my patients before a conference. We have conference from 7 to 8 every day on uh, mostly vascular and interventional radiology didactics, whether it be case conference or journal club, uh, or going over a selected topic that day. Most of our attendings are present at those conferences to teach us about selected topics in EIR. And then at about eight o'clock, we run the board, get patients teed up. And then at that point, we're either operating or rounding or uh, seeing consults throughout the rest of the day. And then at the end of the day, after all our patient care is done, typically, you know, late in the evening, we'll, uh, you know, run our list, figure out what else needs to be done for our patients, and then we'll go home and then we'll kind of repeat it after that. That's typical, that's kind of the typical day on the vascular and interventional radiology service here at Visla. Um, very similar over here at Christiana. Um, generally, our cases start at uh, 8 a.m. or 7.45. So I usually get there six um, pre-round on patient side, uh, either you know did a procedure on yesterday or that are going to have procedures. Um, you know, run the list. Uh, we typically also have um, conference at seven a.m. Whether it's case conference, uh, journal club. Um, sometimes you know because I'm a PGY two going through my diagnostic years, we sometimes have diagnostic lectures at seven a.m. as well. So I'll attend those, um, and then cases start pretty much at eight, you know, do cases, see, um, see patients between cases. Um, and then, it, you know, depending on how busy the day is, you know, you'll be working till four or five or later. Um, um, and at least at our program, we generally, the way that call works is uh, we have, we work one weeknight a week and one weekend a month. Um, you're taking at home call. Usually when you're doing call on the weekends, um, you'll, probably be coming in to do a couple of procedures, whether it's like follow-up for arteriolytics or venous lytics, um, or just things that can't wait till Monday. Um, but yes, it's a very, um, you know, clinically focused uh, day where you're actually seeing patients, not just hanging out in the uh, angio suite. Perfect. And so since, uh, since vascular and interventional radiology still has the word radiology in it, Melinda and Avi, what do you guys like about diagnostic radiology? Yeah, sure. Uh, you want? I, yeah, I can go. Um, man, I mean, it's also a great field. I mean, we have to know anatomy head to toe, essentially. I think, um, you know, Dr. Newton re referenced creativity earlier, and I think the 
the diagnostic knowledge that you gain certainly allows you and gives you the edge to be even more creative with the ways you approach procedures. I mean, you saw Dr. Chicks talk about the retro, uh, retrograde length angiography. I mean, those sorts of uh, things that we're able to pick up, I think, are really based on the fact that we have such a thorough understanding of not only anatomy, but the ways we protocol studies, the way uh, we use imaging to our advantage to be as minimally invasive as possible um, and help people. And so I think, um, you know, I think it's easy sometimes, especially if you're really into IR only, uh, potentially to, you know, maybe, and maybe, you know, you get a little bored or whatever during your DR years. Uh, but if you kind of keep the end goal in mind as to what's really important um, and how you can kind of integrate all this knowledge together to be the best you can be for your patients, um, keeping creativity um, and your expertise in imaging and in consulting and communicating with other disciplines in the hospital, I think they respect you for that. Um, so I think that's something to definitely keep in mind. And one of the uh, beauties of the diagnostics components of our training it really separates us. Yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of that. Um, I think DR is the basis for IR. Like not all of it is applicable to what we do, you know, full time, hopefully in the future, but it is really what sets us apart because otherwise we're just kind of crappy surgeons who don't actually do open surgery. So you need to understand the imaging, you need to understand the modalities, the differences, the pros and cons of everything. And that's how you can actually use imaging to guide your procedures in a way that nobody else in medicine can. So understanding the diagnostic part of it is really what sets us apart. There are bits of diagnostic training that won't necessarily translate down the road. Like I don't love learning all the different staging criteria for every single different type of cancer, but it's, you know, it's part of the training. All right, Millie and Henry, I know you both did quite a few away rotations. How did you decide where to do an away rotation and how did you optimize or how did you stand out as a student on rotation? Um, I guess uh, I can go first. Um, the way I chose it was uh, a little bit strategic. Um, you know, I heard about Christiana and I wanted to show um, East Coast programs that I was serious about moving out of California, if that came to it. Um, so I did a rotation out here um, and found out that I really liked liked it here. Um, and then I also planned to do a few rotations at university settings. Um, Christiana is a, technically a community program. There's no university um, associated with it, but um, just seeing the different practice types, I think that opens your eyes to how uh, IR can be practiced um, in different uh, practice settings, like I said. Um, but I just sort of planned, uh, planned it strategically so I would get both East Coast and West Coast programs and community and university programs. And um, sort of, you know, based off of those rotations, I uh, chose where I thought I would fit in the best. Um, so for me, it's kind of similar to Henry. Um, I have always been in California, but I knew that matching uh, IR in California was going to be, ch chances were pretty minimal. Um, somehow I ended up staying in California. Um, but I did do a bunch of away rotations out of state um, just to show programs that, hey, yeah, like I'm willing to go anywhere for getting good training. Um, so that was kind of my strategy, um, my approach. Um, and in terms of standing out on rotations, um, it's an extremely fine line. Um, I believe one of our prior PD panelists had referred to it, but your social IQ. Um, you wanna be hardworking, um, you don't wanna be annoying. You might know the answer, but I had a you know, couple times come up where it's like, okay, it's better to just you know, bite my tongue and not, kind of be that prick who's gonna show up a, a resident, you know? So um, you kind of have to know what the situation is. Um, when is it a good time to ask questions? You know, is the patient coding? That's probably not the best time to ask. Um, and then also like, how do I help out the residents to make their lives easier? Um, and I actually found it very uh, interesting as a student where, uh, I found it that, you know, the fellows and the residents for most rotations are going to be the ones who are doing the procedure itself. Um, so how do I get involved as a student without 
um, stepping on their toes. And I found that the best way was to learn how to work the back table, which I believe was Dr. V's um, advice to me, which I felt was golden. Um, so learn to work like a tech because the techs are, for the most part, extremely willing to um, let you do their job and teach you their job. Um, so you learn how to, you know, work the wires, work the catheters, how to set everything up, flush, and then um, you kind of get to the point where you can do that work without having to look down at your catheters and whatnot, or, you know, when you're filling the syringes. And so that way you can start watching the monitor and trying to um, get more of the operator's uh, perspective on what's actually going on. Um, and so now as a resident, um, starting out my IR rotations, it's like, I feel like that has translated extremely well to now being in the operator's shoes. Um, Cause in that way, like the fundamentals of handling your catheters and wires are already there, so. I, I realized I forgot to answer your second part, but to echo what Millie said, now that I'm a resident and I see med students rotating through, I just expect med students to know anatomy and to know things that they can look up uh, on patients' labs, how to do the procedure. I don't expect them to know how to do the procedure step by step, but that's things that you can sort of uh, show as a med student that you're learning or you're willing to learn. It's just looking up the, uh, looking up the patient beforehand knowing what their history is, knowing the lab values, knowing some anatomy, um, everything else you'll learn in residency or just through the rotation. Um, so I think just having that good attitude as a med student is, is a way to stand out. Perfect. Um, and so I'll, uh, I'll end with one last question. Um, everyone can answer it. Uh, Zaim, we'll start with you. What is one piece of advice that you would have for medical students interested in VIR? So my one piece of advice would be to just get out there, get to work, be involved, don't be shy or timid. You need to, you know, with anything you're doing, whether it be away or research or shadowing, just get out there and show what you could do. Uh, don't be just that student that sits in the back, kind of silent, afraid to ask questions, you know, afraid to pick the brains of whoever they're working with. You know, obviously, as Millie said, social IQ is important, so you should know when you can, should take a step back and when to, you know, be more vocal. But, you know, on the other side, when I, when I'm evaluating students and, you know, working with students, I notice the people who stick out who are, you know, not afraid to ask questions, not afraid to give their thoughts, not afraid to grab the wrong wire and hand it to me and I'm just like oh okay uh, not yet <laughs> so you know just get out there and do work you know that's all I can say Abby you want to go yeah sure um yeah I mean uh Zayim and I rotate together, so I, I kind of know what he's saying, and I agree with everything, you know, he said. I would say uh, the main thing I would say is uh, just to stay hungry, but also be really humble as well. I think um, I think it's been in the chat box a bunch, but as a, as a my best piece of advice is, you know, as a medical student, you're rotating. No one really expects you to know much as soon as you start an IR rotation in such a foreign field, and you really don't get much medical education or lectures about it, especially in your curriculum years, but um you can learn so much from the technicians, the sonographers. These are all very integral uh, players in the field when the intendings are busy, when the residents are you know, doing other things and you might feel alone or left out. You can always go to the cases before they start, learn how to set up the room with the techs. Uh, they have done this zillions of times. And so they often know the steps for every single step of the procedure and they can teach you all these things. Uh, then, you know, you'll learn the back table, et cetera. And when, then when people come in the room, you already know what's going on. And it's a great way to um, build camaraderie with these other integral members of the team. Um, and they'll vouch for you too, you know. Um, the other thing is um, for your medical school rotations, um, I, you know, for me, it's just like, it, you can learn a lesson from all these different rotations you go through. Um, and so try to find something positive in each of those things. 
Um, and, uh, you know, cause all of the, all of the medical school knowledge that you're gaining, IR is like head to toe field. So it's all ends up being relevant, even though you may feel like it's not. And that includes the social determinants of health as well, too, in addition to all the physiology, cause you're going to be working with patients from all different walks of life. And that's really important to build that social IQ into your practice pattern and your knowledge base as well. Um, and lastly, I would say when you're working on your personal statements and things like that and trying to get into uh, a residency program, it's really important to just be 100% authentic yourself. Um, you're going to end up in a place that is the right fit for you, that where your values align with the program's values, and it just happens, and that's where you end up. And, and being around the people that are like you the most, that cherish the things you you know you do as well um that's going to allow you to be in an environment where you thrive the most and so i just want to emphasize that you know be true to yourself all right melinda yeah i think i'm gonna <laughs> repeat a lot of what was said but i think the most important thing is to think about what you want out of your career you know like choosing a field is not just what's a decision that you make during med school, it's actually gonna affect the next several decades of your life. So really think about what you actually wanna do, what draws you to IR. Um, and if you just come in with the approach that you wanna learn, that you're here to learn, like don't worry too much about impressing people, don't be scared to reach out. Everyone in diagnostics and in IR is very, very approachable. And it's a, a big reason I think why many of us chose this field over a surgical subspecialty. So just come in you know, willing to work hard and with the approach that you're just here to learn as much as you can. And if you find that that approach, you know, thinking about what's best for the patient, how you can become a better doctor, then you're not going to go wrong. You're going to find a place where you fit. All right. Millie? So I think in addition to everything that has been said already, um, I feel like a Pre-COVID, um, attending conferences was a huge game changer for um, for me, at least, because um, that's where you learn about you know, different um, aspects of IR that maybe the hospital that you're at, like maybe we don't do that many procedures and that type of stuff, um, but the new stuff on the horizon and also networking, you know, these are your colleagues, um, and I believe uh, I think it might have been Dr. Roshan um, had said at one of these conferences that, hey, like, look to your left, look to your right. These other students, they're going to be your colleagues, you know, so don't see each other as competition, but like, that's your, that's your teammate, you know. So, um, yeah, hopefully once COVID kind of pans out, I guess, um, conferences will be a, a thing again. All right, and then I'll end with uh, Henry. Uh, just building off of what Millie uh, said, you know, conferences, I think the biggest advice um, for, especially for students coming from smaller schools um, is networking, um, whether it's at conferences uh, in person, virtually, or just through Twitter. Um, I found that Twitter was a very helpful tool to learn about different programs all across the country, um, to learn about cases, you know, a lot of attendings post cool cases to learn about just latest developments in the field. It's, it's just a big Twitter family on there. Um, you know, I was never a t big Twitter guy um, and it still comes and goes in waves. Like I don't really use it as much recently, um, but it's always nice to log on and just see all the cool cases that everyone's doing. Like, you know, a week ago, I could see that, you know, Abby was doing a cool case and he could post it on, on Twitter and share it with everyone else. Um, and so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not too late or not too early, never too early to start getting on Twitter and um, making a specifically a professional uh, Twitter account. All right, sounds great. Thank you all for your valuable input. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna show a, share a screen, a QR code with our post um, conference survey. Uh, we'll also be playing this tomorrow. Again, if you, haven't registered for tomorrow's conference, we have some very exciting panels. We have an international panel, private practice panel, and Dr. V is going to give a really excellent talk. Um, and we're also going to hear about, um, about some research um, as well. Um, so again, um, I'll leave this up for just a couple of seconds. Um, I think that brings us to an end of our Saturday curriculum. Thank you all for taking the time out of your Saturday, uh, both the panelists and attendees. And uh, thank you all for your 
your great discussion and um, great teaching points.